art and culture terms which are very relevant for upsc aspirants you must be always wondering what is art what is culture and that is why we brought an expert with us upsc essentials welcome all of you to our new branch show with devdat patnaik on art and culture of the upsc essentials let us first talk about what's going to be the structure of this program so devdat patnaik is going to explain us in his own style and expertise about various terms ideas and questions which are relevant for upsc with respect to art and culture but here is something special about it devdat is going to answer questions which are asked by upsc aspirants yes so you can ask questions to devdat speaking about various themes of your syllabus art and culture of upsc syllabus so first of all welcome devdat to your show to our show of the upsc essentials with art and culture with devdat patna so today's theme devdat as you all know and uh, as all our aspirants are already informed about is about art culture and we are linking culture with civilization so there is a question which is posted by one of our students one of the aspirants and she sent a video question so let us begin with this question hello my name is rashmita my question is can you discuss culture is what we are and civilization is what we have so this is basically a past upsc question and which is uh quite relevant for a upsc aspirant to ask a question from the past year upsc paper and uh, since devdat has gone through a lot of questions from past year he would agree that you know upsc sometimes ask these a uh, tricky question which doesn't require so much factual knowledge but it definitely requires analysis so uh, the trend here is or the style of this uh, video series will be that i'll break up this question into smaller parts so that devdat will help us to reach this wider question by discussing also the smaller tidbits here and there so as rashmita asked that can you discuss culture is what we are and civilization is what we have let's break this down to the first important question which is a very relevant question which is what is culture and its important elements so culture is the human way of life so human way of life that's the simple answer plants and animals don't have culture humans have culture now when we look from an archaeological point of view humans have evolved over millions of years so when do we say that we stopped being apes and we became humans we become humans when we start showing signs of technology which means now we have started creating stone tools using fire hearths we have started using jewelry we have started drawing on the cave walls this indicates we are no longer animals we have now started becoming humans that means there's a human way of life emerging and that is culture every human being has a culture and that's the point which must be remembered there is no human who does not have culture so whether you are a tribal person or living in a village or living in a city whether you living in different parts of the world doesn't matter as long as you are human you have made the journey out of the animal kingdom you are no longer a ape you have become a human you have started using technology you have entered the world of culture that's the first point to remember now why do humans create culture is the question and that leads us to the elements of culture so i always remember the basic remember way to remember is aise roti kapda aur makan aadmi ko roti kapda aur makan chahiye so culture may be there would be something to do with roti kapda and makan so it will something to do with food there will be something to do with house something to do with security and there will be um, clothes jewelry that is the beginning of you know that is economics right i want food i want clothing i want shelter 
तो वो होगा कल्चर में एलिमेंट्स इसको बनाने के लिए इन ऑर्डर टू गेट दिस थिंग्स इन ऑर्डर टू गेट रोटी इन ऑर्डर टू गेट कपड़ा इन ऑर्डर टू गेट मकान आई नीड टूल्स एंड टेक्नोलॉजी सो देर बी टूल्स एंड टेक्नोलॉजी एज पार्ट ऑफ कल्चर वंस यू हैव टूल्स एंड टेक्नोलॉजी वंस यू हैव दिस इकोनॉमिक नीड्स यू विल ऑल्सो हैव सर्टन इंटेलेक्चुअल आइडियाज बिकॉज वी आर ह्यूमन्स ह्यूमन्स के पास विचार होते हैं कल्पना होती है दुनिया के बारे में हम सोचते हैं कि वॉट इज द पर्पज ऑफ लाइफ तो फिर हम कहानी बनाते हैं सॉन्ग्स बनाते हैं स्टोरीज बनाते हैं विच वी एक्सप्रेस इन स्टोरीज सॉन्ग्स पेंटिंग्स आर्ट इसमें हम व्यक्त करते हैं तो ये सब कल्चर का हिस्सा बन जाता है आई मीन आई रिमेंबर इट लाइक दिस आई मीन बिकॉज आई स्टडी मैथोलॉजी आई ऑलवेज से तीन देवियां हैं भारत में लक्ष्मी दुर्गा सरस्वती लक्ष्मी इज फॉर इकोनॉमिक्स रोटी कपड़ा मकान सैलरी दुर्गा इज पॉलिटिक्स पॉलिटिक्स इज पावर शक्ति से यानी कि टूल्स टेक्नोलॉजीज लॉज ये टेक्नो पॉलिटिक्स में आ गया और फिर सरस्वती तो उसमें आर्ट्स आ गया म्यूजिक आ गया डांस थिएटर आर्ट आर्किटेक्चर सब आ गया वहां पे सो इफ आई रिमेंबर लक्ष्मी दुर्गा सरस्वती आई नेवर फॉरगेट कल्चर हम कल्चर से संस्कृति में हम इन तीनों का निर्माण करते हैं it's a very lucid way to explain in a very clear and uh, probably that is what i think upsc aspirants need ki aap simple tarike se aur gagar mein sagar bhar lijiye isn't it <laughs> so wo uh, the, that style of you dev that and i think it's all the aspirants who are watching us should also understand ki when you're writing an answer that should be conveyed that that simplicity that clarity should be explained properly conveyed to the examiner and since you have talked about this buzzword culture now let's move on to civilization so suppose if i ask you that what is civilization you've explained what is culture now let's let's understand what is civilization and its important elements hey, you know i sometimes whenever i want to understand something i try to translate it so when i say culture people will say sanskriti so jangal nature is prakriti culture is sans संस्कृति हो गया संस्कृति फिर व्हाट इज सिविलाइजेशन फिर हिंदी वर्ड आ जाता है शायद सभ्यता यू नो सभ्यता बट नाउ कम्स सिविलाइजेशन इज अ स्लाइटली प्रॉब्लमैटिक थिंग बिकॉज यू नो सौ साल पहले द वर्ड सिविलाइजेशन वाज यूज वेरी डिफरेंटली एंड टुडे वी यूज इट वेरी डिफरेंटली सौ साल पहले ब्रिटिश का राज था कॉलोनियल पास वर देर एंड दे वर ट्राइंग टू से दैट दे वर सिविलाइज्ड यू नो यूरोपियन सेड देवर सिविलाइज सो दे सेड अ सिविलाइजेशन इज अ कल्चर विच हैज ए कॉम्प्लेक्स सोसाइटी वेर देर इज हायर आर की मतलब एक पदानुक्रम होता है देर इज अपर क्लास लोअर क्लास एलिट एरिस्टोक्रैट एंड देन देर आर कॉमन पीपल ऐसे एक हायर आर की होता है सोसाइटी में एंड देन दे सेड ये बड़ा बड़ा सिटीज होना चाहिए मॉन्यूमेंट्स होने चाहिए दे शुड हैव पैलेस टूम्स तो दे केम दे यूज दीज वर्ड्स बिकॉज दे देम सेल्स व कॉलोनाइजर्स दे ऑल्सो वर डोमिनेटिंग एंड दे सेड ओ वी आर सिविलाइज बिकॉज हमारे पास बड़े बड़े बिल्डिंग हैं इमारतें हैं वी हैव टूम्स एंड वी हैव अ क्लास बेस्ड सोसाइटी उच्च वर्ण नीचा वर्ण दिस काइंड ऑफ सिंग एंड दैट इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ कल्चर सिविलाइजेशन दैट यू विल फाइंड इन मोस्ट टेक्स्ट बुक्स हाउ एवर इफ यू रीड द लेटेस्ट आर्कियोलॉजिकल वर्क एंड यू रीड द बिग स्कॉलर्स टूडे दे विल से देखो सिविलाइजेशन ये बहुत ही भयानक डेफिनेशन है सिविलाइजेशन का बिकॉज वॉट इट ट्राइज टू सजेस्ट इज पीपल हु डोमिनेट जो एम्पायर्स बनाते हैं हु कंट्रोल पी कॉलोनाइजर्स इंपीरियलिस्ट ये लोग सिविलाइज uh, हैं और जो कॉलोनाइज नहीं करते हैं आक्रमण नहीं करते हैं किसी दूसरे का वो लोग सिविलाइज नहीं है और जो बड़े बड़े इमारतें नहीं बनाते वो सभ्यता उनमें नहीं है दैट इज नॉट ट्रू व्हाट सो द डेफिनेशन दैट नाउ आर्कियोलॉजिस्ट आर यूजिंग इंक्रीजिंगली आर्कियोलॉजिस्ट मोस्टली इज डज अ कल्चर ट्रेड और नॉट ट्रेडिंग जब ट्रेडिंग होता है यानी कि मेरे पास कुछ सामान है आपके पास कुछ सामान है वेन स्टार्ट ट्रेडिंग थिंग्स विथ यू देन अ कल्चर बिकम्स अ सिविलाइजेशन a culture takes care of its own people a civilization works with neighbors with other people so now let us take the example of harappa harappa civilization indus valley civilization ki hum baat karte hain usko civilization hum kyu bolte hain because it was part of the bronze age trading network bronze kansa which is a mixture of copper and tin now in order to in this civilization there was trade happening between india and iran 
इंडिया वॉज गिविंग समथिंग इंडिया से क्या जाता था मोस्ट प्रॉबेबली कॉटन मोस्ट प्रॉबेबली सेसमी तिल का तेल सो so, ये यहां से जाता था एंड वी वुड सेन लैपीज लेजुलियन ज्वेलरी वुड गो आउट ऑफ इंडिया और वहां से कुछ आता था सो वॉट वुड कम फ्रॉम देयर प्रभैप्स बिटूमेन जो टार के लिए यूज होता है मे बी दैट वॉज कमिंग तो लेन देन हो रहा था ट्रेडिंग वॉज हैपनिंग एंड दैट मीन इट इज अविलाइजेशन सो द डेफिनेशन ऑफ द वर्ड सिविलाइजेशन फॉर मी दिस इज अ मोर इजी डेफिनेशन इज अ ट्रेड बेस्ड बट एज एड यू कैन नॉट फोर गेट द ओल्ड डेफिनेशन ऑफ अ कॉम्प्लेक्स सोसाइटी सो द ओल्ड डेफिनेशन इज सिंपल कॉम्प्लेक्स द न्यू डेफिनेशन इज नॉन ट्रेडिंग एंड ट्रेडिंग सो जो ट्राइबल ग्रुप्स होते हैं फॉर एग्जाम्पल देर आर द ट्राइबल ग्रुप्स इन एंडमैन आईलैंड झरुआ ट्राइबल्स आई थिंक तो वहां पर दे आर नॉट ट्रेडिंग दे डोंट लाइक टू ट्रेड दे डोंट लाइक स्ट्रेंजर्स कमिंग टू दे आर आईलैंड दैट मीन दे आर स्टिल अ कल्चर बट दे हैव नॉट रीच सिविल दे डोंट वॉन्ट टू ट्रेड उनको एक्सचेंज नहीं करना है सो वी शुड रिमेंबर दिस पॉइंट how does civilization come into being we start talking to our neighbors exchanging ideas exchanging goods exchanging resources then lots of things start to move from one place to the other that is the beginning of civilization it's interesting david how you have also explained the old way of thinking about civilization and you know the current way of how archaeologists now define it and therefore for aspirants or the people who are uh, going to write exams you should take care of both the definitions and explain it in terms of you know the examples probably that will uh, convey the point better isn't it now if you may uh, you know for for our general understanding just just very briefly if you can just this difference differentiate between what is culture and what is civilization though you have defined it but agar hame मोटा मोटी छोटा मोटी भी पॉइंट्स में अगर करना होगा सो व्हाट व्हाट शुड बी राइट कल्चर इज द ह्यूमन वे ऑफ लिविंग वेयर द फोकस इज इंटरनल it is taking care of its internal needs it's taking care of its economic needs its political needs its intellectual and aesthetic needs civilization is one which is larger in scale and is looking at other people's needs also and therefore when you talk about other people you start moving into complex societies so upper class lower class you start talking about laborers bureaucrats merchants farmers warriors priests so there are different groups of people and you're also talking about other communities neighbors friends enemies with whom you are exchanging goods you're exchanging ideas and therefore trade routes comes into the picture so that is the fundamental difference you don't talk about trade routes you don't talk about a class system or a um uh, multiple groups of people working together each one specializing in different things these things do not come um um when you're talking about culture uh, well if i want to be very complicated then i'll say all civilizations are culture but all cultures are not civilizations well i can see this as a question <laughs> i can see this as a specific advanced question you know uh, it's a good you've given a clue to paper setters and examiners this question this kind of question i think <laughs> to think about it you know it's like all minerals and ores minerals are ores yes. ores are minerals and vice versa kind of thing well, interesting interesting uh, but you know pardon me if i'm wrong uh, but there's a curious cu- curious manas in me and i'm sure a lot of aspirants would ask you that there is also these words like uncultured and uncivilized so if you have defined what is culture and civilized civilization can you also like tell me uh, or tell us what is uncultured what is uncivilized how relevant these terms are so these words are used as terms of insult so nobody uses this nicely that you know when you say he's a cultured person and he's not cultured which means a non cultured person would be like a savage he does not follow human rules he is not functioning like a human being um he doesn't use utensils he doesn't use tools so um that becomes a uh, uncultured man he is not behaving like human he is behaving like a savage or an animal savage is a human who behaves like an animal that's the way and these are words as i said of insult which were used by people to insult those who they don't like then comes civilized he is not civilized it means he doesn't know how to deal with people who are different from him 
he doesn't know how to deal with people from different cultures he doesn't know how to deal with people from different communities different class he doesn't have he doesn't know how to negotiate with difference and this is important as i said when you talk of civilization scale increases diversity increases you're talking about different types of groups of people and engagement between these different types of groups of people so it's no longer a tribal community where you know everyone and everyone dresses the same way and everybody follows the same rules. Now you're dealing with multiple groups of people, each one following different vocations, believing in different things, following different customs and practices. How do you deal with differences? If you can't deal, ki nahi, nahi, I can't deal, he's an uncivilized man. He doesn't know how to deal with different people. That's true. Now, if I, if I move beyond the basics and uh, if I ask you that, a little advanced question that how India's ancient civilizations, which we are now we are talking about civilization, how India's ancient civilization differ from its contemporaries. Like for example, you have Greece, Egypt, or Mesopotamia, etc. So in general, if you can say that, what is that unique thing in Indian civilization? So you know, let's go to a little bit of you know proto prehistory. You know before. So you have got initially in India, you have stone tools being seen. Then you have suddenly you have got this explosion of very organized cities which were trading, which means civilization, which is the Indus Valley civilization. But that's not all that is in India, right? Then you have the what is called the Vedic period. In this period, you find in the Gangetic plains, you have got these painted gray wear uh, material, basically special kinds of pots which are different from the Harappan pots. The Harappan pots were red in color and black in color. Suddenly, you have a new group of people which is using grey color pottery. Meanwhile, what's happening in South India? All this is in North India, Northeast and Northwest. South India, may you suddenly have these gigantic mounds, what's called ash mounds. They were like these, maybe they were pastoral people. They had cows, goats, sheep, pigs. They would take the dung and for some reason, they would put it in one place and burn it from time to time. And we find this in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh. We really don't know what they mean. In fact, nowadays, if you go to some of these places, they'll say, Bhasma Sur ka tila hai. So, Bhasma Sur, because ash mound. But we don't know what they mean. So, you have these things in India, which we must remember. So, when we talk about ancient India, we are not just talking about Harappa. We are also talking about these things. And we are, uh, in South India, there are, Hordes of copper things. India was very famous for copper. India was very famous later for iron. Iron, India was a major source of iron. We did not seem to have tin. Tin seems to be coming from Central Asia. So we needed to trade. But you find these copper hordes in many parts of India. Then, and this is all before Vedic period or parallel to the Vedic period. While Vedic period is happening in North India, in South India, you have got these copper hordes, you have got these ash mounds, you have got these megalithic societies, big megalithic rocks. And then you have, you know, for example, in Bagor, which is central India and Madhya Pradesh, you've got one of the oldest shrines, perhaps the oldest deity of India, which is a triangular kind of rock, which is 8,000 years old. Now, all this is part of ancient India. So when we talk of culture and civilization, we should remember this diversity, right? So we must remember we're talking about megaliths, that is big stones. We're talking about microliths, small stones, which are used for utensils. We are talking about ash mounds. We are talking about pottery. We are talking about copper hoards. All this is part of Indian culture, civilization, long before even this Vedic and Harappa overtake, overshadows everyone. But we must remember India is a very big country. And Indus Valley civilization is Northwest India. Gangetic Plain is Vedic area. But the rest of India, what about Deccan? What about this? And then we look at now Egypt. Now, this zone is as big as Europe, right? It's as big as Europe. Maybe, uh, you know, so South Asia, which is India, is a very big region. Now, when you talk of ancient Egypt, you think immediately of pyramids and tombs, right? When you talk about Mesopotamia, you talk about ziggurats. Ziggurats are these big structures, pyramidal structures on top of which there were temples. Now, what is the fundamental difference that you notice? And we are talking about Bronze Age period. Bronze Age was a very important period in human history between 2000 BC to uh, uh, maybe before that, two and a half thousand BC to 1500 BC. For a thousand years, trade network was happening with, from Afghanistan. Lapis Luzuli would travel and travel from Harappa to Mesopotamia. Now, what is the big difference that you noticed or I have noticed? One is ideological. 
ideologically you find and that emerges much later in culture is in the Indian subcontinent the idea of rebirth is a very important idea that shapes Indian culture. Indian culture is shaped by rebirth. I'll keep coming back to this point in all our sessions. While in the Middle East, it's Egypt and Mesopotamia, the idea of one life becomes important. You have only one life. Now, Devdath, how do you come to this conclusion? The conclusion is wherever people believe in one life, they build tombs. Tomb building is a major activity in cultures which believe you live only once. We, India does not have an equivalent culture of the pyramids, of the massive tombs filled with treasures that you find in Mesopotamia, which is Iraq, or in Egypt, that is the Nile Valley, in the Euphrates and Trigger. So although all of these are river valley civilization, all of them are farming civilization, Neolithic civilizations, all of them are urban civilizations, the number of tombs that you find, you don't find an equivalent number in India. One of the possible reasons is this ideological difference which shapes India. And I think this is an important point to remember. We cremate the dead. And you have narratives, when you come to the, even in the Harappan zone, you find compared to the population, the number of burials are very few. We have found very few burial sites compared to the huge massive population which lived here. And it has been a mystery. In Dholavira, for example, they have found um, um, grave sites with no bodies in them. They are just sort of representative tombs. There are no bodies there. So it's very strange for the number of population. Did they cremate the dead? Did they just throw them in rivers? Did they expose them to the elements? They didn't build tombs. I think that is an important point to remember, which makes Indian culture unique. Uh, and it shapes our thinking in very, very big ways. We'll In the later period, it becomes more evident. Right at the early period is something which I have noticed. This absence, we have tombs, but nothing of that scale. I think it's also interesting because, see, this is a vast question and uh, I would like to inform it to our viewers and aspirants that we're going to do a lot of shows with Dave that, uh, and in future episodes, we're going to talk about these things in detail. But when it comes as a question, you know, and you have a limited time and word limit, this is how you can approach, you can pick up a point and explain through it. So, for example, they've talked about ideology difference, you know, and so that is a big difference between different cultures. And also, uh, as rightly pointed out that uh, it is not about when we talk about civilization, it doesn't it doesn't start only with Indus civilization or Harappan culture, or it is way more than that, before that and afterwards. So these are certain points which aspirants should keep in mind. And I think speaking to Dev, that clear, you know, clearly tells us that what's going to be our approach. So what we've done today, and the show is still not over, but just to give a brief that we talked about what is culture, we talked about what is civilization, then in a unique style by giving examples, they've that also differentiated between culture and civilization. Then we talked about the two terms, uncultured and uncivilized. And we also discussed a larger question comparing the Indian civilization with the other contemporaries. Now, here is something special which we do. Devdath is going to leave us with a point to ponder, which will also be a catch for the next episode. So Devdath, can you, for, for our viewers, for our aspirants, for students, and all the culture enthusiasts, give us a point to ponder for the next episode. Why is history of great relevance for art and culture? So when you, art and culture doesn't exist in a vacuum, it always exists within a historical and I would add geographical framework. So think about it. And that's an important point to ponder about. Excellent. And what clicks to my mind that today we have seen, we've compared and we have connected culture with civilization. In the next episode, we are going to talk about culture and art. And this is how we are going to talk about with this point to ponder. And I would like to thank Rashmita for a wonderful question, which helped us to break down the question and uh, get such valuable insights from Devdath. 
from the in the next episode we'll have a new aspirant a new student asking a question to devdat and devdat is going to break it down for us into simpler points and will again give us a point to ponder so that's all for now we will be back with devdat connecting culture with art in our next episode and don't forget to subscribe the indian express youtube channel and upsc essentials also we'll have an article followed by this video which will have key takeaways from devdat's today's talk and uh, that's all from uh, upsc essentials of the indian express and as i say before going think smart work hard conquer your goal why is history of great relevance for art and culture so when you, art and culture doesn't exist in a vacuum it always exists within a historical and i would add geographical framework so think about it so how to study art and culture well that is the question which brings us today to this brand new show of UPSC Essentials Art and Culture with Devdat Patnaik where we are going to learn today about art with a we culture and uh, Devdat through his unique style through his lucid manner and through his creative explanation is going to let, let us explore various dimensions and various aspects of culture and art so first let's welcome Devdat uh hi devdat how are you doing hi hi how are you so devdat as we all know the format uh, the format of the show is that we take up the questions from students students okay. ask you a question and you okay. through uh, in a very lucid manner you break down the question into simpler parts so that we cover both basics and advanced and finally we reach out to the larger question in the end dear viewers Dave that gives you a point to ponder, which is also a connecting question to our next episode. But mainly, as we all want, thinking administrators who should feel about India's art and culture. Therefore, point to ponder becomes very important, which is right at the end of the show. So, if Dave that you are ready, let me you know ask you the question which has come from one of our aspirant. So I think it's an intelligent question. She brings not only history but also geography, and then she tries to ask you a question linking it with art and culture. Now uh, let's uh, they've done break down this question uh, from basics so that we can reach to an advanced level. So if you can uh, simply tell to our uh, students, aspirants and culture lovers that what is art? So art is an expression of culture. So that's a simple understanding. It's an expression of culture. We express culture through art. So culture has two parts. Um, one is the there is an idea there is a thought but that is not visible i can i can see it i use the word mythology for it i call it the cultural truth so i can't see it i can't but i can how do i access a cultural truth i access it by looking at something tangible and one of the things i look at is art so art can be performing arts so singing and dancing or plastic arts like painting sculpture which i can put in a museum when you look at art there is plastic art there is performing art these two are tangible they can be physically but the amongst the tangible what can i put in a museum i can only put the painting i can put the sculpture i cannot put music unless and nowadays we can record it of course but you can't musical performance a live performance or a dance i can't put a dance in a museum i can put a photograph of a museum dancer but i can't put the dance in the museum all these are expressions of art and the intangible side is the myth or which i talk about the idea the cultural truth 
Okay, so that's that's a, a very uh, structural definition of art, and I think important is for students to understand that when you are describing art or you're talking about art, you must tell about intangible and non-intangible part so that it it gives you a, a better edge there. Uh, now. The, the second part of the question, uh, which will finally lead us to the larger question, is that how should we link art to culture? And, you know, are there some differences? Because sometimes we just get confused between these terms. Last time you told about how civilization and culture are similar, but yet not same. Similarly here, what about art and culture? How do we differentiate between them? So as I said last time, Culture is how humans express themselves. That expression takes a form which we call art. So what form does it take? Um, does it take the form of a building? Does it take the form of a statue? Does it take the form of a um, painting? These are art objects. What about, um, so let's you know, take it at a very practical level. I come to your house. Your house has a culture. How do I see your culture of your house? If you tell me, Dave, that how do we, I come to your house? How do I see the culture? Um, I suddenly notice when I enter the door, there is a toran outside your house. There is a certain marks outside your house. So I see footwear is kept outside the house. Then I step inside your house. Um, I suddenly notice that you, when I walk in, you'll say, Devdat, glass ka pani liji. So now I'll say, I'll say water has been given to me. They give me some something to eat. Now, if you go to Sweden, it is quite possible the house will have no toran. There is quite possible nobody expects you to keep shoes outside. Maybe the snow shoes will be kept outside, but you can walk in with shoes. Because a cold country. And then you will notice that they may not offer you water. They may not offer you food. And they don't think it is awkward. So now we see two different cultures. Two different ways of being. Now of this, what is art? The toran for me is an art object. I can't, The maybe there is a particular kind of footwear that I can put inside uh, a museum. That becomes an art object. But the giving of what that is, Stem. While that is part of culture, that is not art. I can't put it in a museum. I can't put it, I can't show you in a museum the act of giving water, the act of giving food. That is also part of culture, but it is not art. So culture is a bigger word. Art is a smaller word. Yeah, so I think uh, very pinpointingly when you said about the expression and how expression takes form, uh, that is a very good distinct uh, distinguishing feature which you have talked about. But also, you mentioned the word toran in your explanation. And I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to ask my uh, viewers and the aspirants to mention in the comment box, what is toran? Because toran, it's, it might be very general for experts like you, but students, aspirants coming from different you know quarters, they must know what is toran. Toran is a very important part of you know this art, architecture, and culture. So uh, comment in the box below, dear aspirants, that what is Toran? And I must also tell you that this has been a question, if I'm not wrong, in UPSC examination prelims around the term Toran. Okay, so uh, coming back to our uh, discussion. So we, we've understood what is art. We have tried to see the link between art and culture with a little bit of difference. And now coming to something which a lot of students want to know, that how should we study art? Or how do we study art? So, all art and all culture exist in time and space. Time, so it is past, so there is a time period in which it, it occurs, and there is a location where it occurs. So, time, sthan or kal, very important. Sthan kaun sa hai? So, geography becomes important. Where is this object from? Where? And the second question is, when was this object created? So history becomes important. Kala becomes important. For example, if you look at these images that I have shown, look at the images that we have shown in this um, video. You can see there are two images of Vishnu lying down. 
they don't look the same. They're, they're both Vishnu images lying down. One is coming from the central part of India, Deoghar, dated about 1500 years ago. It is Vishnu sleeping on a serpent from India, central part of India. Deoghar is south of Jhansi somewhere. And it is about 1500 years ago from the Gupta period. The other image is not coming from India. It is coming from Southeast Asia, from Cambodia. And it's about a thousand years old. So now I have two art objects located in different geographies, in different time periods, expressing the same idea, Vishnu lying down. Now I can show you two more images uh, of Vishnu standing up. They both come from India. One is coming from the Pala period. Pala period is around the 8th, 9th century. That's about 1100 years ago. And from Bengal. The other is Shola, which is about 10th century, 1000 years ago from Tamil Nadu. So one is coming from the eastern side of India. One is coming from the southern side of India. Both are, uh, Chojola bronze is about 1000. The other uh, Pala period is a little older, about 1100 years. So now I have got history and geography. I see the statue, they look the same, sleeping Vishnu, standing Vishnu. But the moment I put a history lens and a geography lens, they are now different. That is a step one to study. So um, I always say history and geography are very important. Another way to remember um, uh, is the beginning point. The starting point is always this. So I always tell people to remember the rule of Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. This is my model of remembering Satyam. What is it really? It is a statue. In this case, which I've explained to you, it's a statue made of stone, made of metal, made in this period, made in that period, made in this location, made in that. This is data. Simple information. This is Satyam part, which you should know. This is non-negotiable. When you go to a museum, you will see this plaque, which gives you all the Satyam part. Then comes Shivam part. What is the statue? It is Vishnu. It is standing with, it is, what is Vishnu? What does it mean? Why does it have four, is it a male, female? Why does it have four arms, not two arms? Is it a supernatural being? Who is the supernatural being? Uh, now I am want to know the story of why is he lying on a serpent? Why is he standing up? Why does he have four arms? Why does he have conch shell in one hand? Why does he have a disc in the other hand? Why does he have a staff on the other hand? Shivam, the uh, what makes it auspicious? What makes it, what is the meaning behind the statue? So meaning becomes important. Usko shubh, so that is the shubha part of it. And then comes sundaram part of it, which really UPSC aspirants don't need to know, which is the aesthetic value of it, which a uh, art historian would like to know. You know, is it a good piece, bad piece? How beautiful is it? Is it symmetrical? Is it proportion? What kind of finish is there? That, as, as I said, uh, UPSC aspirants do not need to know it. They focus mostly on the satyam part. Even shivam part is good to know, but I don't think it's necessary from an exam point of view. What you need to know is time, place and identify the image at least. Yeah, also very interestingly, you brought this Satyam Shivam Sundaram because I remember a uh, few years back, there was a question on Natraj yeah. and uh, the, the, the symbolic aspect of it. And it was so I think it's it's a good perspective to see things from that you know uh, from that uh, perspective that what this symbol it symbolizes and what it tells us and you and students can use it in different ways in their answers to make it more creative and more indicative so uh, yeah but uh, i was i was wondering there that if you can like uh, you did tell that sthan or kal kitna important hai but just Briefly, if you can, you can tell for our uh, students that uh, if you just outline a few things and why history is thus important for studying art and culture. See, um, history is important because as time progresses, technology changes at a very basic level, technology will change. Um, uh, so new technology emerges and that is shows in art forms. Uh, for example, uh, if you go to the Mohenjo Dado period, you will have brick structures made, right? So technology, material which is used, when was bronze used, when was copper used, when was gold used? This becomes very important. We find bronze statues. So does it mean, so in, in, we call um, Harappa belonging to the Chalcolithic era, which is copper. They don't use the word bronze much because we find mostly copper with arsenic. We don't find Copper with 
tin. Now, these conversations about copper, arsenic, tin are Bronze Age conversations. Vedic period, iron has appeared. What is called Krishna Aya. So, as time passed, now a new technology has emerged. Then you will notice in other subjects, for example, when these Vishnu statues are being built, what is happening in India? You are finding kings becoming very powerful. The idea of Raja Mandala is becoming important. Chanakya's concept of the circle of kings and the four arms are in four directions controlling the circle of kings. The concept of Chakravarti becomes important. Chakra, wheel, which you see in Vishnu's hand, the wheel. So now a new idea emerged with time. It was not there in the Harappan times. It was not there in the Vedic times. The idea came only in the Gupta period, a new idea, but also technology. Because I, having an idea is not enough. I also have copper and bronze technology. Then it is coming in the Chola period, thousand years. Why? Because now they have got this special lost wax technique of how to make so now that I have got the metal also, I've got the idea also, but do I have the technology? You know, when we talk about paper, when we suddenly use the word paper, kagaz kalam, even today we use the word kagaz kalam, look at the sound of the word. This is, these are Persian words. These are not coming from Sanskrit base. Kagaz and Kalam came to India with the uh, Delhi Sultanate around the 13th century, 14th century. Kagaz and Kalam comes. Before that, Indians use Tambra Patra or we use metal strips. Um, Tambra, uh, sorry, Tada Patra is palm leaves. Tambra Patra is copper. We use stone. We use cloth to write. We didn't use paper. We were familiar with paper because we were dealing with the Chinese. But paper production technology comes to India only in the 13th and 14th century. So now when I see a paper, I know it doesn't belong to the Vedic period. I know it belongs to a later period. You know, the old, like, um, you know, we, when you go to, you'll say, I want to see the oldest manuscript of uh, Rama and Mahabharat. Oldest. Now, we it is not 3,000, 4,000 years old. You go to Baroda Oriental Institute and there you will see a palm leaf manuscript. So, Tad Patra ke upar likha hua hai and then you date it and you realize it was written in the 8th and 9th century. It's a copy. It would have started, somebody would have started writing it maybe 2000 years ago. But the copy we have today is about 1200 years old because these papers were, would get damaged. So you would keep making copies after copies. But when Akbar started producing paintings, he had access to paper. So we have the Razam Nama in paper. So time tells me about technology. Time tells me about ideas. So time is a very, very important thought to keep in mind. So that's how history shapes culture. Yeah. And uh, there is some point to catch. I, I, I would like to suggest it for my aspirants that look how Devdutt is trying to explain things by taking examples, which is across the period. And probably sometimes when, when aspirants find it difficult or the, in writing a particular question in examination, they feel, uh, feel short of words and they're unable to express it properly. It's these examples that become very important for the examiner to, you know, realize your answers, uh, to understand, and it becomes easy for you to write. So that's why note down these, uh, uh, these examples and it's across the spectrum of history. It's just not limited to ancient or medieval or modern. It's just, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to write even an answer. So what they've done is uh, making it easier for us is giving us <laughs> the answer script uh, in his way of explaining things. So they've done, since you've just, you've talked about uh, some aspects of history and culture if you can also uh, talk about geography and culture so that you know Tuba's question is complete so when you see geography now uh, one of the things I do I always advise people is to create a table on the x-axis of your table that is uh, you know you have an excel sheet nowadays everybody's access to an excel sheet on one axis you write geography so write North India, South India, East India, West India. It's very, very important to keep a map next to you when you're studying. I find many people don't have a map next to them. Keep a map. Second thing is timeline. Are you talking 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1000 years ago, 2000 years ago? And you have to keep practicing it so that in your head, you start remembering Mughals were for 500 years ago. You know, when, when did Akbar live? 
1600 is a simple number to remember Akbar. How do you remember Aurangzeb? 1700. How do you remember Mauryas? 300 BC. How do you remember Guptas? 300 AD. So that is how you remember. And between 300 BC and if you do 200 BCE and 200 CE, you will have the Satavahans. Now, why is geography important? Now, um, most of ancient India is North India. We don't get much information about South India. The only information we get about South India in ancient times is the Sangam poetry. That also the old Sangam poetry. That's it. We have no other. Now there are these um, excavations happening in Keladi and there would be questions on Keladi excavations. But this, we don't have much information other than it is as old as the Buddha's time. But that's it. We don't have anything very big to talk about in a paper. But we know that Tamil culture existed 2,500 years ago, maybe 2,800 years ago because of archaeology. But generally, when we speak of Harappa, we speak of Northwest India. When we speak of Vedas, we really speak of Northeast part, the Gangetic Plain, not even going to Bengal. It is only Uttarakhand, Pan Haryana, Punjab, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh area may be going to Bihar. By the time we reach Bihar, you have the Buddhist culture, Jain culture emerging, Videha, Mithila, that is the area. So now geography has become important. The moment I say Vedas, I am not talking about South India, I am not talking about Andhra Pradesh, I am not talking about Maharashtra, I am only talking the Gangetic plain. So when you say 16 Mahajanapadas, they are all in North India. North of now, the question is, David, why is North India important? You realize Vindhya mountains are very difficult to cross. Now, yeah. let's look. I was asking somebody a question. How do you cross from the Vindhya mountain? When you look at the map of India, you will notice that people would travel, right? They've traveled. We have heard of Dakshinapatha, Uttarapatha. But Dakshinapatha is not South India. Dakshinapatha is from the Gangetic Plain to Malwa, to Madhya Pradesh. So Dakshin for whom? Dakshin for Gangetic Plain. Uttarapatha is Mal, uh, Gangetic plain to Gandhara, that is Pan, uh, Punjab and Pakhtun areas. That part of Pakistan today is called Gandhara region. Kekaya, which is Kaikai and Madra, these are all in Pakistan today. Gandhara, Kaikaya, Paik. So geography becomes important. When you talk about um, Ujjain, Avanti, you are really talking about Madhya Pradesh. We don't go south of that. Vindhya mountains is there. Narmada, Tapi rivers are there. Everything is in the north. When does South India become important? Because to cross the Vindhyas, there is Ahirgad and there is Gauligad. And you'll say, why have you used these words? Ahirgad, Gauligad. Please read Anglo-Maratha War. And you'll realize the British, when they wanted to control the north and south of India, they fought these two wars in Ahirgad. And in Gauligad, which is the pass through which you pass from North India to South India. The third place is Surat. And they're all in the western part of India. What about Chhattisgarh? What about um, the region of Jharkhand? These were Dandakar and a big forest. Nobody used to cross these forests. Extremely difficult until railway lines were built by the British. Before that, nobody traveled these places. There were no trade routes. You would go from Bengal to Odisha via the coast. You have to cross rivers. When you talk about the Vijayanagar Empire, you are really talking about Krishna Tungabhadra region fighting happening between Bahmani kings and Vijayanagar because of the... Now you say, where is Krishna river? Where is Tungabhadra river? When you say Satavahan kingdom, you have to know Godavari. Godavari flows from Vindhya region towards Andhra Pradesh. This region and where the Kaveri and Ganga... So all the Telugu speaking people know about Kaveri. They know about the delta of Kaveri, the delta of Godavari. That is the richest area of India, richest area of South India, where the Ikshavakus lived, Satavahans lived, Kakatiyas lived. So all culture has to come where there is money. Wherever there is money, there will happen. Where is money? Where is good agriculture? Where is good agriculture? Where there are deltas? Where are the deltas? Geography will tell you that. So if, unless you know, art will come. Oldest artwork comes Amravati Stupa. Where? Nagarjun Konda. Where is Nagarjun Konda? Godavari and uh, Kaveri Delta. Where is it? It is in Andhra Pradesh. You have to look at your map and you will realize it is the Godavari and Kaveri River Deltas are located over there. And you will realize that so that geography is so important. 
you talk about cholas you have to talk about the river kaveri you have to talk about the river kaveri cholas without kaveri don't exist kaveri has river islands on which there are three river islands on which there are images of vishnu sleeping the same image that i showed ranganatha swami built so those three river islands were vaishnav centers built by ramanujacharya at the time of the cholas 10th century i cannot discuss cholas without talking about this river so geography becomes important right kaveri is not important in the vedas kaveri is not important in harappa period they are not important at all but cholas without kaveri you can't talk about pallavas you have to talk about the uh, region north you have to talk about um, chidambar you have to talk about kanchipuram in the what is the north madurai vaigai river vaigai river becomes important kaveri so rivers are playing a very important role in shaping our understanding of pallavas where are the pallavas where are the pandyas where are the cholas just see where the rivers are and you will know everything so we almost uh, answered what tuba wanted to ask she wanted to basically understand culture and art with respect to both history and geography and you have given a lot of what i say for our for our answers with so many examples uh but also uh just to go a little bit more advanced from the basics and if you allow me to ask you a question which is uh you know uh what is so unique about indian art i mean this is a very obvious question but i think everybody should know it that what is so unique about indian art and connecting this to something which we need to do it in present that how can we sustain and preserve it in art okay so the thing to remember is that one of the indian art is diverse that's the first thing you have to keep in mind why why do i say diverse because we are looking at different geographies and we are looking at different time periods we are also looking at different kinds of communities for example taj mahal is a indian art architectural form which follows a persian art form mixed with indian art forms in india so they use material from india so they use uh, marble they use inlay if you see the structure it looks very persian because it has a particular the minarets are there the dome is there which all persian but when you start looking carefully it has lotus motifs which are very indian but at the same time now you look at a jain temple which has a shikhara which is a series of the the shikhara is the roof which is like a spire small mountains on top of mountains this you know small mountains big mountains all coming together to create the shikhara of a jain temple and you realize hey that is also indian now the both look so different one looks persian one looks jain will somebody will say it's hindu but we'll say no 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 it's jain so it's a jain art form so now in india we have to talk of uh, diversity there could be look at an image of lakshmi you'll say lakshmi images are indian images but i can show you one lakshmi image which is from the buddhist side how do i know it is buddhist it comes from the region of sanchi barhut it is about 2000 years old so time place and third i look at the object carefully and i notice that the lakshmi has only two hands not four and then i look at a tanjore painting a painting made in tanjore so south india made about 100 years ago again lakshmi but now she has four hands so now i have both of them are indian art but there is so much of diversity so diversity is a key word to use and in diversity you talk of diversity of time diversity through space diversity through communities and that is how you explain indian art now let's look at a greek for something foreign i have got an image of a tirthankara a jain tirthankara standing it's a uh, nude statue of a male and i have another statue from greece which is also a nude statue but you notice a difference the greek statue has muscles very clear muscles the indian statue has no muscles very smooth lines so now i'm looking at sundaram artwork indian art avoided using muscles traditional indian art the body is smooth nowadays we find all these ram images and hanuman images lots of muscles and the artist art historian will say hey this doesn't look indian because he is used to seeing traditional indian art had the gods had no muscles muscle as an idea emerges with greek art and now because young people are exposed to superman and hollywood we like six pack abs and we want our gods to have six pack abs and that is westernization of india we are using a greek idea greeks loved muscles 
Indians did not like muscles. Indians liked healthy bodies, but they liked athletic bodies, but they liked health. You know, the body has to be lean. It has to be fit, but muscles cannot be seen. So now look at the two statues of the sage standing and you look at the hero, the Greek hero standing. You see these two images. They, they, you'll say they're men. Both are men, but they're very different. One is a Greek statue with muscles. One is an Indian statue without muscles. One is eyes are shut, meditative stance. The other is a hero, but that's a little detail. But this is a big difference that I tell people. Musculature is not found. Any temple you go to, you'll never see gods with muscles. Chola bronze, no. Chola bronze, look at the Pala image. Look at the Chola image, no muscles. Now, how do you sustain art? Now, one thing is certain things um, can be kept. How do I, uh, you know, there are different ways in which art survives. One is just by living your life and following the practices of your family. So the simple way of living, keeping your culture alive is every generation tells the stories, follows the symbols and rituals of the previous generation. So how you eat food, the way you eat food, your culture is being maintained. How you maintain your house, what is the artwork in the house? These are at a very basic personal level, we keep our culture alive. We keep our culture alive through festivals. We keep our alive through food practices. What can we keep alive? I always tell people the Chinese culture is alive as long as they use chopsticks. The day they stop using chopsticks, Chinese culture is not there anymore. Then there is the artworks that we have. Some can be kept in museums. Some has to be protected in museums. Then they have monuments which have to be protected, um, made into tourist zones. Uh, they become under the archaeological survey of India. So suddenly you find these architects, um, architecture is kept, artworks are kept. Then you sponsor and patronize traditional Indian art forms, whether it's the classical dances. Nowadays, we have one film, a single film called you know, Kantara has rekindled uh, uh, interest in a very traditional Tulu Nadu practice known as Bhutakodam, which is part of Tulu Nadu. Where is Tulu Nadu? Tulu Nadu is the southern part of Karnataka. This is followed by the Tulu speaking people. This culture suddenly became big because of one film made by one man and he thus helped in supporting that culture. And by that one culture, now people are talking about Thayyam and other practices in other parts of India. So just by making a film on it, he has ensured the protection of a particular culture from um, dying away. It's very interesting. And I think uh, using these uh, examples which are happening now, you know, in the form of movies, in the form of songs and other forms, not just government policies, but what you can do and what one can do at an individual level in your home, outside your home, that is very important. And I think that is something which is attractive in answers also. So uh, that is all what we have for today. But before going, there is Devdath's point to ponder, which is going to link us to the next episode. And uh, Devdath, if you can, for our uh, aspirants, give a point to ponder. Are we right to say that tradition is in the past, culture in the present, and heritage is linked to the future? So this is a question I want to think about. Tradition, culture, heritage, words that we use, and how is it connected to the present, past, and future? All right, then. And that is a clue for me. Probably this is going to be Devdath's next episode where he's going to talk about tradition and heritage and something more. So we've covered some very basic terms which people should know about an art and culture, but in a very standard and very, you know, beautiful manner with examples and pictures really help dear us. But it's, it will it will help you to retain what you learn from each of these videos. So this is Manas signing off and don't forget to subscribe the Indian Express, uh, the YouTube channel of the Indian Express. And as I say before leaving, think smart, work hard, conquer your goal. Are we right to say that tradition is in the past, culture in the present and heritage is linked to the future? So this is a question I want to think about. Tradition, culture, heritage, words that we use and how is it connected to the present, past and future? Welcome everyone. This is UPSC Essentials. 
are in culture with Devdutt Patnaik. We are in motion. We are in the third episode. We have covered a lot of basic terms in a very advanced manner. And today, again, we are going to connect culture with two very important terms and maybe another important term which you would appear in the course of our discussion with Devdutt Patnaik. But first of all, let's welcome Devdutt. How are you, Devdutt? How are you finding it? Uh, talking to students, explaining students about art and culture. I'm enjoying it very much. Very nice. Going to the basics, asking very basic questions is very powerful. Exactly. And uh, so as we all know, the format of the question or the format of the show is that students or aspirants uh, talk to you directly in a way they pose questions to you they they uh, the, from the the question can be basics at time there can be some you know thought provoking question and you sail them through uh, from the basics to advance helping them with examples through the pictures and of course through your words so that they can understand the soul of this subject and that is why we are aiming to uh, you know uh, take them more through such videos, more through this program. We're going to have a lot of discussion with you. But today, let's focus on this particular question. So uh, we have a student whose name is Rishabh Jaiswal. And Rishabh Jaiswal sends you a question, which is this. Often culture, heritage, and tradition are used interchangeably. What are the similarities? And what are the different points of differences between them? Please explain with examples. So, Devda, uh, now let's uh, let's let me just for the understanding of our uh, readers, uh, of our viewers, let me just uh, dictate or just just tell you what he asked, and he says, often culture, tradition, and heritage are used interchangeably. What are the similarities? And what are the points of differences? Please explain with examples. And I'm sure he says with examples because he knows that it is in his answers he have to he has to write examples, and therefore he mentions that please explain with examples. So uh, let us uh, break up these this question into smaller parts so that our audience understands it in a better way. So let's begin with simply defining what is tradition and what is heritage. So tradition is culture of the past. Heritage is the culture that we of the future, culture that we want to take forward with us. So tradition is something that existed before and heritage is something that we want to go along with us into the future. That's it. Wow. So very brief and, you know, very crispy. And I think it's important that students will be able to retain this also in their mind when they have one liner and two liner definitions for them. So let's look at a def. Uh, let's now explain it with example. So, for example, let's take, you know, in the um, in medieval India, we find stone steels, like stone uh, where um, there are images called sati stones. Women used to immolate themselves in the funeral. Usually women from warrior communities would immolate themselves in the funeral pyre of their dead husbands. Then there are veera stones. People who died in battle or died uh, when uh, saving the village from a wild animal like a tiger they would be the place where they would be cremated or buried. They would put a stone and put carvings to say this man has gone to heaven and his spirit protects us. These are called Veera stones found in many parts of India. And then there are places where Jain Munis would fast to death practicing Sallekhana. And these are the Nishidi stones. Now these three stones like fasting to death, uh, uh, dying in a violent situation while protecting the village and then killing oneself on the husband's funeral pyre. These were commemorated in steles and these are part of Indian tradition. They existed in the past. Do we want to carry forward these practices in the future? 
no we don't want people uh, to uh, you know di- you know people die in battle right we have shaheeds who die in battle when they are fighting but we don't want it to happen we don't want to want people we don't want people to die we don't want people to starve to death we don't these practices while they are part of tradition sati practice was there in the past it is not something that i want to take forward however these stelis these stone statues which are there i want them to be protected in monuments i want them to be part of museums so we don't forget our past that is how this is the example i would like to give people that there are certain things in the past which exist in the past which we may like to take forward those art art images those stone statues but we don't want to carry forward those practices great so we we get a definition and we get examples so uh, this kind of you know gives a good capsule for our uh, definition based questions which students always come across in their examination now let us understand also that how heritage since you've explained it is linked to culture so um you know um, my heritage is a culture is something that you're living right now right now culture is something which is present you have a culture it is informed by your past so you are informed by certain traditions that come from the past but there are certain things that are bygone era that you carry forward with you which i said is heritage so when we talk of culture it has a past component a present component and a future component past component as i said is tradition present component is culture future component is heritage what i take forward for example the sanchi stupa look at the sanchi stupa which is found in madhya pradesh it's a beautiful structure which is about 2000 years old beautiful artwork now from a current present point of view there is no connection i don't know what to do with this structure it's there it belongs to the past but it is part of my heritage i want people to remember it in the future that you know 2 and 1/2000 years ago in um, india there was a man called buddha who taught uh, a buddhist ideology and people venerated him and therefore built stupas in his honor and kings layers and layers of kings and merchants built railings around the stupa built gateways around the stupas they carved these statues and this tells us how life was over 2000 years ago in india and therefore the sanchi stupa is part of my heritage it's not my culture today and i really don't get it from like immediate tradition i don't see any tradition over here but there is my heritage because i'm going to take it forward because it is a memory of my ancestors if you if you allow me to ask you a very connected question like we we've discussed about these basic terms which are related to art and culture we started with civilization in our first episode and then we moved on to art today we are uh, talking about heritage and um, related term uh, but there is also a term called custom and a lot of time people talk about this is in my custom this is not and all so what is this you know uh, what is this basically what do we mean by the term custom and how is it connected to culture so custom are practices of the present certain practices of the present it is my custom so for example uh, in the morning i wake up i do not eat until i take a bath now that's a custom i do puja before i eat i have a puja room in my house and after i do puja i eat now that's a custom why do you do it it is my belief that god lives in my house he is my tenant he i'm sorry i am his tenant he is my landlord the house really belongs to god this is my belief and because i believe he is the landlord i am i am the tenant i have a custom that in my house i first will feed him and then i will feed myself but before i feed anyone i believe that we have to purify ourselves and therefore bathing becomes important so now i have a custom i have a day to day practice these are all happening in the present so in the present i have a belief which manifests in a custom ye customary hai i do it it doesn't make logical sense to people um it is not as just i'm it uh, going to office or driving to work or working in the office these are also activities but these are not customs customs have to be inherited and followed because it connects your present 
to the past. You are following a belief system and a custom that probably you have inherited from your parents or from your grandparents or from people around you. Great, great. And I'm, I'm, it's more interesting that how you brought the word belief in it and how it is more connected to custom. So, uh, so they, they, we have covered almost all, uh, you know, these basic terms which are related to art and we may be theoretical, but they're very important for examination and to build up from here. You know, when we are going to go deeper in the topics, we need to uh, be aware about these terms. Uh, but just to move from basics to advance, if I may ask you that, you know, what is the soul of India's cultural heritage and tradition? And if you can explain it with example. So the soul of India's culture and heritage, when someone asks me, let's ask, what do we mean by soul? When we mean soul, soul is something that you cannot see. So what people are really saying is what is the underlying belief system of Indian culture, which makes it different from, say, Chinese or makes it different from Middle Eastern practices, European practices. So what is the fundamental belief system? And a simple answer could be one of the things is the belief in rebirth. Indians believe in rebirth or we believe nothing is permanent. Things come and things go. The, like, for example, the Buddha said nothing is permanent. So in India, when you do, Gan when you have, you know, this famous Ganpati Puja in Bombay, there is this Ganesh Puja, which happens. You worship the image of God for 10 days. After 10 days, you'd put it in the Visarjan in the river or in the sea. It goes away. Durga Puja happens for 10 days. After 10 days, you take the image of the deity and you put it in the sea. You do Varalakshmi Puja in South India. They do the Puja of the deity and they then put it in the water body. You do uh, Satyanarayan Puja in, uh, urban, in your house. After the Puja, you take all the flowers and all the, the pot and you put it in the sea. Which means nothing is permanent. So the, the one of the unique ideas which shape Indian thought is the belief that nothing is permanent, not even death, which is why we believe in rebirth. Nothing is permanent. So that's a very powerful idea in India and that is not found in other parts of the world and that is what makes us a unique culture. There's a very important question since this is a show about the future bureaucrats and they're going to be part of the government. So how, how government, you know, protects or safeguards the art, culture and tradition, if you can ask them. So, you know, government comes up with policies to protect monuments. Let me give you an example. All monuments exist on certain public areas. For example, it could be middle of the forest. It could be next to a river, next to a lake. And let's say tomorrow you want to drain the lake or you want to build a dam or you want to claim the forest for mining activities. You could be destroying some very ancient structures. Now, should we go ahead or not? That's a question. That's a dharma sankat that the government will have to deal with. Now, a real case is the case of Nagar Nagarjun Konda, which was an island uh, which contained these, you know, on the in Nagarjun Konda in Andhra Pradesh, there were these monuments which were dated to over 2000 years ago at the time of the Ikshavaku period. So, in the uh, Godavari Delta, we had these you know, about after the Satavahans, you had these kings known as the Ikshavakus and they built these fabulous Buddhist and Hindu structures and they were about to be destroyed when the Nagarjun Konda Dam was being built. And therefore, the government of India had to take a huge decision of shifting the entire site brick by brick to an island which where it is standing today. And this is a point that we often forget. This could only be done by government paying attention that heritage is important. You have to invest a lot of money Archaeologists have worked together. So many people have to work together to protect that monument, which is two and a half thousand years. Otherwise, you know, so many temples get washed away uh, because of dams. They get sub submerged in rivers. Uh, in, in, in Egypt, there was this Abu Simbel temple, which was to be destroyed completely by the Aswan Dam. And then an international effort took place. And that is when UNESCO and all came together and saying world heritage sites are important. There are certain sites that need protection. Just as we need to protect certain plants and animals, um, uh, we have to also protect certain uh, monuments that come and you know this Nagarjuna is a case study that we must remember how we manage now um, you know Taj Mahal people talk about industrialization and all the chemical pollutions affecting the marble may be destroyed could it be destroyed we need funds to protect the monument can we take policies where we stop industries from coming in these areas that has an economic cost can 
only a government can take these decisions. You know, then you have tribal practices which are dying away, um, you know, musical instruments which are used by tribal communities. And as they are moving to urbanization, taking up jobs, those old musical instruments are being forgotten. If we need, this is when it cannot be supported. Do we need a private public partnership? Do we get corporates to support these old musical instruments, keep records of them, archive them? It costs money. This costs funds, taxpayers' money. Do we have enough money for that in a country like India? These are difficult questions that bureaucrats have to answer. And I think it is important to remember um, that. Uh, you know, preserving and conserving heritage, while very important to our culture, is also expensive and is an economic burden. And we have to manage it very gently and some difficult decisions have to be taken by future bureaucrats. Definitely. And that's why the future bureaucrats should understand the importance of art and culture because they're going to be decision makers of tomorrow, implementing a lot of things. So that is why this question was very relevant. Great. So uh, what we've done today is we have talked about certain basic terms as we were doing in the past videos. And also uh, you allowed me to ask an advanced question where you really touch the soul of Indian heritage by telling us what is the soul of Indian heritage. So uh, but before going and before uh, leaving our viewers in your own style, your point to ponder for your aspirants. I think the point to ponder this time is how has international relations played uh, an important role in making our culture? We don't live in an isolated framework. We live with neighbors. There are people around us, different cultures around us. And I wanted to ponder is how has our international relationship impacted our culture, our art, our heritage? That was an interesting point to ponder. And that gives me a hint that next time we're going to talk about cultures abroad, exchanges, how do we learn from others and what do we teach others? And that is an episode which I'm going to wait for. I'm sure all our viewers are going to wait for. So that's it for now. Manish Shrivastav signing off. Thank you, Devdutt, for your show today. And uh, remember one thing, that is you have to subscribe to the Indian Express YouTube channel to get more such videos. And don't forget, to think smart, work hard, conquer your goal. Thank you. How has international relations played uh, an important role in making our culture? We don't live in an isolated framework. We live with neighbors. There are people around us, different cultures around us. And I wanted to ponder is how has our international relationship impacted our culture, our art, our heritage? Hello everyone, I am Manas Srivastav and you are watching UPSC Essentials of the Indian Express and our show that is Art and Culture with Devrat Patnayak. We actually covered a few very important topics in the past. Today is one such important topic which is a part of our series. Yes, we're going to see and we're going to talk and Devrat is going to explain that how does culture get shaped by foreign connections. And as you are aware by the format of our show, is that we actually take up the question from aspirants, from students, some points to ponder in their mind or something which they have come across while reading and studying. And they want our expert, Devdutt Patnayak, to answer. So let's have a look at this question by Arunika Mathur from Bhopal. So Arunika wants to ask that over the years, our relations with different cultures have been shaped, our food has been impacted, and what syncretic dishes have come out of this cultural contact and exchange? So what a wonderful question, and I think it's a very UPSC relevant question where they don't ask directly, but they pick up some kind of example to test your knowledge. And here, what Arunika wants to ask us is about foreign connections, the how culture is shaped around it, what we gain from outside and what we have given to the world. But she specifically wants to ask in terms of food. But Devdutt is going to make it simpler for us, diverse for us, and 
contextualize in terms of what UPSC wants from students as answers. So we're going to break them down into simpler questions. First, let's welcome Devdat. Hi, Devdat. And thank you for doing this for our UPSC aspirants. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Devdat, let's begin. If uh, you're ready for the first breakup of this question, the larger question, which was on different cultures and where uh, Aranika talked about food, asked, wanted to ask you about food. But let's start with a very simple question, and which may be simple, but it's diverse in the range, that how should we trace the long history of India's connection with the world? So, again, like in all my uh, conversations on culture and civilization, history and geography both are important. That is time and space. So when you're answering a question related to uh, trade, you have to ask which period are we talking about? And second, which part of India are we talking about? So let's understand history first because currently we are in the 20th century. 200 years ago, we had a British colonizer controlling us. Now, in the early part of the British Empire, they used India for finished goods. They would take finished goods from India to Europe. But in the latter part of the British Empire, they would take raw materials from India. And that is how Indian economy collapsed. So you have got a trade contact in the British period. First part is with finished goods, which is handcrafted materials from India, woven cloth from India. And the latter part, we go, didn't give cloth, we give cotton. And cotton would go to the other countries. So that is the, before that we had the Mughal Empire. Now that was before the Industrial Revolution. India was the land of crafts and lots of things. There was cotton going out of India, silks going out of India, spices going out of India, handicrafts going out of India. So that's the British period. Now, uh, I'm sorry, the Mughal period. Then you go before that, you have the Sultanate period. Before that, you have the Chola period. And the Chola period, you have heard of this famous right now, Ponir Selvan film, which is talking about our trade relations with Southeast Asia. Before that, when you go, you come to another period. You come towards the Satvahan periods when you have cotton trade with Rome and the Roman Empire. That is now... You have got a cotton trade with the Roman Empire, which is about 2000 years ago. So when you talk about the Gupta period, pre-Gupta period, even the Mauryan period, you have now talked about the Roman Empire. Now, before that, what is happening now? Again, we go in history before that uh, period, so before the Satavahan period. Now, remember, Satavahan period is between the Maurya and the Gupta period. So, look, I'm going traveling back in time. Now, before that, I will come to the Mauryan period and we have Alexander coming. Alexander is a Greek. So, now you have connections with Greece. You have connections with Persia. So, now, look how I've traveled through time. Now, if I look, travel through space, geography, I will say, I have to talk of trading links from the coast, eastern coast, western coast, eastern coast, southeast Asia, western coast, we are going to Arabia, Persia, and from Arabia to Persia, we are going to Mediterranean region, which is the Roman Empire. Then we go to the north, you have got the Khyber Pass and the pass, which is beyond the Thar Desert, through the land routes, where does this go to the land routes? It goes to Central Asia. So, Samarkand, Uzbekistan, those words will emerge. These are words which we connect with uh, Delhi Sultanate, with even the Kushan Empire, the Bamiya sculptures. All those things will come over there. Central China will come over there. And then you come to the Himalayan kingdoms. That is, you have Bhutan, Sikkim, Assam. And from there, you go to China and connections with China. Uh, so, you have to understand the geography of India. You have to understand the history of India. And then... Map this in a two by two. I always will make a table. On one side, you have history. On the other side, you have geography. And you will understand India's trading patterns over time. Absolutely. And that reminds me also of our previous episodes. So aspirants, students, viewers can go back to our previous episodes where Devdad has talked about how history and geography is very relevant when you study about his art and culture. And that's so everything is, we, we, everything is so connected in that manner. And uh, so when we are talking about the history, I'm sure there's a very prominent question which comes in uh, minds of people that, okay, ye exchanges ho rahe hai, 
हम ट्रैवल कर रहे हैं कल्चर का आदान प्रदान हो रहा है बट कैसे सो वॉट आर द मीडियम्स ऑफ द कल्चरल एक्सचेंज एंड दैट इज आर सेकेंड क्वेश्चन so um, again reminding people that the definition of culture means you are able to generate resources for yourself animals don't generate resources for themselves right they go looking for food hunting for food when do you say culture has been created when we are able to gather resources generate resources when we as hunters as foragers then gradually as herdsmen as um, farmers that is culture but once you start exchanging and trading because you don't produce everything right you need to exchange and exchange with people civilization is born so civilization starts when people start to exchange and trade and humans have been trading and exchanging things from the stone age right so we have to remember that why are they exchanging they exchange things because i don't have something but you have something so that is how my exchange will start for example i am a farmer i grow grain but i want to eat fish i want to eat meat you are a fisherman you have fish you get fish i will give you grain you somebody you know uh, we always talk of river valley civilization the river valley there are civilizations where they are growing crops they are growing wheat they are growing millet they are growing barley but what is not there in river valleys there is no metal there is metal metal is found in far away mountains far to where it is dry very farming is difficult so people who have metals don't have grain those who have grain don't have metal they will meet and they will exchange goods there are people who live in dense wooded forests big trees over there like for example today if you go to uttarakhand these regions have trees and big big trees uh, or you go to central india uh, you know where there is the dandakaranya the central asian forests central indian forests you can't farm there very easily it's a lot of big trees but you have trees and so people want wood so you can give wood and in exchange you will get some food so that is how that the reason we trade is again we will trade for i remember it in this way roti kapda makan to what do you trade roti ke liye so wheat grain spices will come fruits vegetables that is what you can trade roti kapda india was the land of cotton that was a special thing that india gave the world cotton from harappa times we have been trading in cotton so there would be uh, clothes there makan of course you can't give makan but you can give wood you can say you know we could export wood because there are places in the world where wood is not available we can give metal metal can be exchanged for example in harappa they needed tar or bitumen bitumen is not found in india it is found in iran so they would take iran say bitumen would come to india what was india famous for it was famous for cotton we would give them cotton and we would get it. we also can exchange uh, skills you have got certain <clears throat> skills um we could make great jewelry we could do weaving so we would give jewelry we could give cloth so these are things that you exchange now while you are exchanging goods and services you could also exchange animals and birds um, uh, exotic animals go to other parts of the world you can give birds people want parrots they want peacocks they want monkeys they want dogs these would also travel across so there are material goods are going along with that ideas are also being transmitted you don't just transmit so you can transmit food clothing shelter roti kapda makan as i said Uh, india had elephants we would export elephants but we wanted to import horses so horse would come elephant would go so that was a very famous exchange that india would do but we also would exchange ideas so buddhism traveled out of india hinduism traveled out of india to southeast asia to central asia remember the geography should come in your mind so but then your mediums of exchange for example if you look at the harappa statue the famous dancing girl statue and look at her neck she has kauri shells around her neck what was kauri shells you have heard of this phrase mere paas do phooti kaudi nahi hai matlab this do phooti kaudi really is a broken kauri shell and four broken shell, kauri shells would make one kauri shell so it was really like paisa and rupee and kauris were used now what is special about kauris kauris are not found everywhere they are found only in like maldives islands they are found so they are found in the certain islands they are not easily available you can't just get anywhere in the world uh, kauris so kauris were used as currency to exchange so that is how you found so we don't just have goods and services and ideas you also have currency in the form of kauri shells 
that is how you logically break down the question to get an answer. Otherwise, you can't remember so much. You don't memorize everything. You ask very basic things. Mirko roti, kapda, makan chahiye. Mirko, uh, so once you get this in place, then everything else will automatically follow. Exactly. And I was just wondering how interesting this is the way to understand a topic connected to what is real life, you know, uh, the, the the what we speak in our daily language. And then things become so simpler. And I think that's how culture, civilization and everything took shape and they were understood. So I think the key takeaway here is when you talk about roti, kapra and makan, I think a brownie point will be when students will or aspirants will mention about the ideas. These are some things which are exchanged and these are so important um, that it shapes history in a way. Uh, so thank you for that. And now let's come to the, another important question, and which is India specific. Of course, we are taking the frame of India in all questions. But when we come to specifically in India, that what has India taken from the world and what has it given to the world, given back to the world? So I know the list can be long, but certain things which you think that the aspirants should know. So what I would do is I would make a table. I would say um, what has in what has what have we imported and what have we exported, right? Import, export, um, and then I would also create another. Uh, so that is one column is import, one is export, and then I would do uh, in the rows I would put uh, roti, uh, food, clothing, shelter, transport, metal like that. So that gives me a framework to s give an answer, right? Very clean. Also, the examiner looks at it and says, "Hey, this person is thinking logically." Yeah. So even if you don't know the entire answer, you'll score points because it shows that there's a logical approach to the answer. It's not like a random rattling out of facts, but there is a process that you're following. Now, let us look from one by one. Let's look at and, and all answers. It may not be, have we exchanged um, uh, in the realm of uh, food. What have we given and what have we received? So, for example, in the Harappan period, I don't know if you know, in Harappan times, they used to sail by little boats. Little boats would travel along. And that time they didn't have sails. They didn't know to go into the deep into the sea. They would go along the shore. So they would use these boats, reed boats and travel along the shore. And if they get lost from the shore, you know how they would find the shore? They would let loose of birds. They would have birds on the ship and the bird would fly and can see the land. It would go in the direction of the land. And that is how they would know that our ah, land is on that side and they would move along that. And you have these Harappan boats, so which we know that from Harappan times, it is four and a half thousand years ago. That is uh, four and a half thousand is 2500 BCE. This is the time when pyramids were being built in Egypt. There were ziggurats in lower uh, and you should look at the map carefully. From Gujarat coast, you go to the Pakistan coast, Makran, and then you come towards Iran, the southern Iran and the Arabian part. Now, this is where the first major trade exchange is taking place. India, in terms of food, what did we give the world? We gave what is called till. Till. Have you heard of till? What is till? Sesame. Kala till. Till. Yeah. Till. So, till se tail nikla. So till and tail were the Indian contribution to the world. We gave tail and we sold sesame and that went out of India and went to the foreign land. So there is this exchange. We, India is the source of sesame, tail. So food mein aagya kuch, clothings mein, we give cotton to the world. India's greatest gift is cotton. In food, another thing that you should never forget in India is besides oil, we also give Ikshu, Ikshavaku, have you heard the name Ikshavaku? Ram is from Ikshavaku, Mahavir is from Ikshavaku, Buddha is from Ikshavaku. What is so special about Ikshavaku? The word Ikshavaku comes from Iksha, Yakshu. That is, it is sugar cane. India gave sugar cane, sugar to the world. Now, transporting sugar is very difficult because it will get spoilt very easily. So, we crystallize sugar. So, and they were probably Buddhist monks who did this. And therefore, what was transported to Egypt it was transported to Egypt and that was called Misri. Misra is the old name for Egypt. Misri. And it was also sold to China. Chini. So Chini, Misri are crystallized sugars which allows for transport. So we made good, but good can't be transmitted. It is very difficult to transmit. And this happened only 1000 years ago. Before that, it was not easily available around the world. So khane mein we have got, I told you sesame, I told you about sugarcane. On kapde mein I gave you cotton, jute. Jute was something which India has given the world. 
Now we come to Makan Devdat. What have we given Makan? We were famous. Uh, you know, kapde mein, by the way, jewelry is important. India would give a lot of jewelry to the world. Um, uh, in uh, Harappa was a major center of jewelry. What did we get from them? Let's ask, what did we get? Did India get things? So, in in one of the things that came into India from the western side is wheat. And from the eastern side, that is from Southeast Asia, we got rice. There were some forms of wheat and rice in India, but our, our techniques became better because we got rice from Southeast Asia and we got wheat from uh, Mesopotamia. So these two things came from outside. During the British time, or uh, during the um, Portuguese time, from America, it's called the Colombian Exchange, India got potato, India got tomato, India got peanuts, India got chilies. So we got lots of things, different kinds of food. You eat cabbage, we eat, cauliflower that we eat, potato that we eat, chilies that we eat, all came from outside. What did we give the world again in food? We gave spices. India was the home of spice. We gave pepper. Among spices, the biggest thing that we gave the world was pepper. Pepper has been found in mummies of ancient Egypt four and a half thousand years ago. So you have now the exchange. We have found objects from India, artifacts. For her. When I talked about Makan, what kind of objects were taken from India? Lots of statues, like Buddha statue has been found recently in Egypt. Then in Pompeii, which is in uh, Italy, they have found what is called the Pompeii Lakshmi. You can find its image on the net that is found there. So we used to give these objects would travel from India. So we have got this whole bunch of, in terms of ideas, what have we exchanged? If you go to Cambodia, Vietnam, Java, Sumatra, Malaysia, you will find Indian ideas have traveled from Buddha's image. You have the image of Hari, Hara, Vishnu, Shiva. You have these idea of kingship, Chakravarti Raja as an idea, Raja Mandala as an idea, Manu Smriti as an idea, traveled out of India. What came into India? During the Delhi Sultanate, we got kagaz, paper, kalam, pen. They came to India. What did the British bring to India? They brought printing technology to India. We brought tech. So the, you have got industrialization came to India. Railways came to India. So where has been an exchange? We have given things. We have received things. But see, once you classify things, it becomes easier. Roti kapda makan, import, export. That is the way I will remember. Yeah, very logical way of doing it. And I think it's not only in the in way to revise and learn, but also in the way of presentation. And as students would agree that presentation in your answer sheet uh, is of very important value. It doesn't matter how much you know and how much you learn. So for example, when Devdutt, you are answering our questions, um, you're keeping in mind that students don't need to write everything. But if you write few things in a good manner, to sustain your point, to express what you want to uh, say, then that that's enough, and that's enough for your word limit and your expressions in the answers. Um, also, just since you mentioned about Egypt and Buddha, uh, just a question for the students, aspirants, and viewers: This Buddha and statue and Egypt was in news. So, if you want to really uh, comment, you can comment, and let's see if you know it. And uh, you know, this is how UPSC have been forming questions. They might not ask you directly, but between the lines, they can connect what is going on in the current and what is there in the static. And this is how you can find a uh, chat show with Devdutt Patnaik so useful. And it's it's a good thing that Devdutt brings such example, uh, which are also current related, so that you can you know update yourself with what's going around the world. Now, uh, let's move on to the next question. So it is so interesting and very fascinating to think about this transportation, the logistics, you know. Uh, it's it's tough to imagine today when the transportation, logistics, everything has become so advanced. And to think in the past uh, with the limited resources, the, you know, the geography and how these things were happening, but these things were moving. And that is important to understand. So, you know, from these smaller questions, which look very small, but have deep meanings and deep connection from the past, Let's move on to an advanced question. When I talk about advanced question, I'm talking about how we connect past to present. So that is the question which I want to uh, put in front of you, Devdat, and uh, let's see how you, in your own style, try to answer that. So what we have understood is that India's connection with outside world, and through your explanation, we've got to know that it's not new, of course, but how today, 
we see this as continuity from past. See, in today, uh, we take so many things for granted. Like, what is what is continuity? For example, if you're eating a samosa, right? We think it is an Indian dish, right? Samosa and jalebi. But neither samosa nor jalebi existed in India thousand years ago. About five, seven hundred years ago, both these dishes were brought by cooks who came with the Delhi sultans, who came from Central Asia. They came from Uzbekistan. They came from Samarkand. And they brought these things to India. And of course, Indians, inside that we put potato. Now, where did potato come from? They came from America via the Portuguese. So the samosa came with the Turkish people. The aloo came from Colombia via the Portuguese. and But we consider it, there is a continuation of this tradition. In India, we are eating samosa. Uh, we talk about uh, practices, you know, Islam came to India, you know, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, not like later. We always talk about thousand years ago, we have about Mahmud of Ghazni coming to India. But before that, we were trading with Arab countries. Uh, so even 1400 years ago, the oldest, one of the oldest mosques are found. One is the Cheraman Mosque in Kerala, by traders and then in Gujarat there is the Bardwara mosque I think near Goga near the Gulf of Kambat which was a major trading zone and we have the in fact we have a mosque where the Qibla faces not Mecca but it faces Jerusalem which is in early in the life of the prophet if you're interested in knowing those details that there we have actually a mosque in India which faces Jerusalem and not Mecca which indicates it is early in the, in the life of the prophet Muhammad this was built in India and that to, after that, you have other kings coming to India. They're bringing new technologies from Byzantium. They're bringing new technologies from Persia. And though, when you go to Delhi, you see the Lodi Gardens. You see these uh, structures in Delhi. Um, you know, when you go to Bengal, Bihar, you'll see Sher Shah Suri's uh, has built mausoleums. Where did these structures come from? They came with new ideas that came to India with people, with traders, with common people who traveled across the country. In the same way, there's a continuity. Even today, we are trading with, we trade with Europe, we trade with America, we trade with China, we trade with Southeast Asia. Even today, we are talking about, um, you know, trade deficit and, you know, how um, China dominates because it controls the trade. And at one time, India was to be this big GDP. Why did we have a great GDP? We always talk about this great GDP 500 years ago in the Mughal times because we were trading. We were trading with this world and this continuity remains. Even today, we are connected with the world. We still share food. Today, we love Korean dramas, K-pops. We love Korean food. Import and export is happening. Korea, if you go to Korea, they will say we have had ancient traditions with India. The princess of India had traveled to Korea to marry a Korean prince. There are stories in Cambodia. There are stories in the Kaundinya Rishi had traveled and married a local Naga princess in Southeast Asia. So yeah, Ramayana is taught in Southeast Asia even today. Garuda Airlines exist in Indonesia. Indonesia is a Muslim country, but the airlines is called Garuda Airlines indicates that these ideas have traveled from India. And even today, we have got good, good trade and uh, relations with uh, these countries. Sri Lanka, we have had a long uh, connection. So trade is going on for the last, as long as humans have been civilized. We have records for over four and a half, five thousand years of India trading with the West, with the East, with the coastal route, by the land route from uh, across the Himalayas, across the seas. So there is a continuation. So as I said, think of time, think of space, think of materials, roti, kapra, makan, and then think of ideas and your answer of anything related with trade will be sorted out. Excellent. And I think uh, from Samosa's Jalevi to airlines and trade, I'm sure students are going to uh, love this and keep this in mind. And I'm just wondering how beautiful answers can become when people can relate these things to daily lives and connect their present to the past. And maybe they can have a better future also <laughs> by talking about culture and maintaining it. Uh, now it's time for Devdutt's point to ponder. But before Devdutt's point to ponder come, uh, these are thought-provoking questions, which not only link you, or which not only Devdutt gives a hint of what we are going to talk in the next episode, but you should also think, you know, take out time and think about these questions. After all, the India or the country expects thinking administrators. So Devdutt, what is your point to ponder? In order to understand culture, you have to understand people. 
in order to understand India, you have to understand Indians. What happens normally in all these cultural studies, we think of objects, so much of objects and architecture and art, we forget about people. It's all about people. So to understand a culture, we need to understand people. And that's a point I would like everybody to think about. Absolutely. And I think we've talked about material culture while explaining, uh, you know, the various terms in the past uh, episodes. It's time now to concentrate on people. And when, I don't know how Devdas is going to take us, but it gives an idea about migration, people coming, people and ideas, so much so. And uh, so students should start thinking about it. And I'm sure Devdas is going to take up uh, a very interesting episode in our in his next session with us. So that's all for now. And I hope you've been enjoying our show. Uh, I would also request all of you, whoever is interested to post questions on art and culture and in our later episodes, whenever the time of that topic come, I'm sure Devdath is going to take up your question. So don't hesitate to ask. And that is what Devdath is here for us. He's making our lives easier. He's making our lives of the aspirants easier. So why not ask questions to him when he is giving you opportunities? So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's all from today. Don't forget to subscribe to the Indian Express video channel, the YouTube channel, and keep reading and watching UPSC Essentials, especially the show with Devdath Patnaik. Thank you so much. In order to understand culture, you have to understand people. In order to understand India, you have to understand Indians. What happens normally in all these cultural studies, we think of objects, so much of objects and architecture and art, we forget about people. It's all about people. So to understand a culture, we need to understand people. And that's a point I would like everybody to think about. There are certain issues which have social importance, but they are rooted in history and culture. One such term or one such issue is of migration. Hello everyone, I am Manish Srivastav and you are watching UPSC Essentials of the Indian Express and we are back with our show Art and Culture with Devdat Patnaik where Devdat answers questions by aspirants. We break that questions into simpler parts and remember we are going to add some new segments to our show which will be helpful for your exams. So first of all, I would like to welcome Devdat to yet another episode of his show, of our show, for every UPSC aspirant, Art and Culture with Devdat Patnaik. So dear aspirants, today's issue is migration. And as the format goes, let's start with this question by one of our aspirants who wants to ask Devdat, a wider, a general question on migration. So Devdat, as you just saw, this question is basically a general question, a broad question on migration. And now let's just start with the breaking up of this question into simpler parts. So if I may begin with a very definitional question and a very factual question, maybe you can add some analysis to it in your own way. The question is that why did people migrate in history? And if I may add a second part to this question, a related part, that how did this migration contribute to culture? So we have to separate migration from traveling. People travel, right? You travel. Uh, like a tourist, you travel like a businessman or a trader, um, you know, so you travel to and fro. The monks travel around the world, pilgrims travel to Tirthayatras, travelers travel to markets and come back. They always come back home. So that's not migration. Migration is when you create a new home. Either you move out of a land or into a land. Emigration is when you move out of a homeland and find a new homeland. And immigration is when you move into and find a homeland. 
So we know the Parsi community immigrated to India five to uh, 500 years ago, maybe 1000 years ago from Iran to escape persecution uh, from uh, the, uh, Islamic forces in Iran. We know that Romanis and Gypsies emigrated out of India and went to Europe uh, maybe five, 800 years ago. So these are the examples that we have. Why do people uh, migrate? Uh, reasons are twofold. Uh, one is they're looking for economic opportunities. So they move a land where there is economic opportunity for food, um, where, you know, they will get a better life. And the second reason is to avoid political persecution, um, some hostility. So they are taking political asylum. So you move out of a land. So Parsis moved out of Iran and came to India seeking political asylum to avoid a threat. So their migration was to avoid a threat. They immigrated to India to avoid a threat. Um, Romanis probably moved out of India seeking different opportunities and different lands. Um, and they were a nomadic people who eventually settled in the European region, settled, but they remain a migratory people, but in their roots seem to be from India. We know that diasporic people traveled from India um, to, you know, in recent times, people have migrated to Europe. They have traveled to America for economic reasons. Um, you know, people have migrated into India for political reasons. So economics and politics are the two reasons, um, economic opportunity and political threat. Whenever there is a shift in population, either people move out of a land or they move into a land and people change, culture changes. So what changes? Um, uh, genetic, genetically people change, which means um, because of genetics, what is genotype and phenotype will change. So uh, when people migrate to a land, they may marry the local people and suddenly you have new phenotypes, uh, dark skinned people, light skinned people, taller people, shorter people. So there is a ge genetic diversity being created. The second thing is they bring cultural shifts. Language may change. So we know that um, Indo-Europeans came to India and a new language came into India. Um, we know that a new uh, technology will come. Horses came to India with the Indo-Europeans. Um, so when migration happens, new things happen. Um, uh, so technology changes, cultural changes and genetic changes. These are the simple ways to understand what migration brings to the table. Thank you, Devdutt, for, uh, you know, underlining an important difference between, you know, traveling and migration, because these are the words which sound and look similar, yet they are not same. And aspirants, students or anybody should actually know the difference before using these words. Also, students must note that how objectively, how, you know, in, in, in the presentation form of your answer, you can uh, divide your answer into different categories. For example, Dave that used that the factors are economic and political. So instead of writing a story, you can make your answer more presentable and more appealing by uh, having such kind of classifications. Now, let's move to the second question. Now, the second question is also a relevant question, which is related more to history. So, Devdath, if you may allow, uh, the second question here is that, can you list down certain important prehistoric migration with reference to our country, India? The earliest migrations that happened into India uh, happened 50,000 years ago. These were people who migrated out of Africa and came to India. So you have very old 50, 60,000 skulls like the Narmada skull, um, which indicates that people have entered Indian subcontinent about 50, 60,000 years ago. Uh, they uh, traveled along the coastal part of India. They traveled and they have settled in certain caves. You have these cave paintings. All these indicates that uh, prehistoric man out of Africa entered India around 50,000 years ago. Uh, unique thing about this migration is a sound which is called the retroflex sound which is unique to South Asia. So sounds like ter, ter, der, der are found only in South Asia and uh, this sound is also found in Papua New Guinea and amongst Australian aborigines indicating that the, the sound came into India uh, with the out of Africa migration and is even present in uh, distant parts of Southeast Asia. The second migration is the Iranian farmer 
uh, migration which happened around 10,000 years ago and from Iran you have these people probably moving towards the Indus Valley and this may have sparked the local um, agricultural revolution which starts around 10,000 years ago and you have people growing wheat now from here gradually you have the Harappan civilization emerging 3, uh, 4,500 years ago that is 2,500 BCE. Now these people traded around the world and therefore there were a lot of travelers traveling there was no major immigration or emigration happening. However, in 1500 BCE, that is around 3500 years ago, we know from genetic data that a new group of people entered India, which had a significant impact on the Indian population. This is the Indo-European migration. Now, this is a controversial point and therefore there may not be any questions on this point because from a political ideological point of view, this migration did not happen. Uh, many political ideologies uh, in India do not believe this migration happened. However, from a DNA test that has been available since 2010, we are fairly confident that a um, male population, largely male population entered India around 3,500 years ago. They brought with them a new technology, um, horse and horse-drawn chariots. Um, they came via Central Asia, which is the Oxus civilization, uh, which is also called the BMAC civilization. And before that, they lived uh, uh, maybe about 3000, uh, you know, much earlier, 3000 BC. They lived probably near the steppes region, north of the Caucasian mountains, uh, north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea. So from there, they came to Central Asia. So Central Asia, they split into two groups. One group went to Iran, one group came to India. Um, and therefore, there are similarities between between the Persian language and the Indian language. There are even similarities between Indian languages, uh, Sanskrit especially, and Latin in Europe, indicating from this step group, one group went westwards towards Europe, and another group came eastwards, which stopped at Central Asia and then split into two arms, one of which came to India. Uh, we often pay a lot of attention to this Indo-European group because of various historical and political reasons. But we must not forget there was another migration coming into India from the eastern side. And this eastern side migration is a very important migration. Um, these are the Austroasiaticus and this is where rice technology came to India. We know there was indigenous varieties of rice in India. In Harappa, we have found some grains of rice, which was probably uh, consumed by the animals. Uh, but this very good quality rice and rice technology comes uh, from the eastern part of India. And even today, there is a slight genetic variations between the western side of India and the eastern side of India. The western side of India shows the greater Indo-European genetic base. The eastern side of India shows the austro -Asiatic genetic base also the language is different uh, for example when you speak Hindi you will say main aata hoon, or main aati hoon. so gender is embedded in the verb um, aata, aati, uh, in Hindi but in Bengali you don't find this they'll say main aya, main jaya, gaya. they will not use a gendered form of the verb in Bengali in Odia and that shows a kind of a cultural difference between the western and eastern side of India now um, so that's the migration shift that you see in the western and eastern side. Northern side has a what is called the ancestral North Indian gene, which is the mix with the uh, Indo-European genes. This gene is also found in the upper community, upper caste communities of uh, South India, uh, but not across. Af uh, South India has a very unique ancestral South Indian gene. Um, and this there are linguistic divisions. We know that the uh, Sanskrit based languages of North India are very different from the uh, grammatical structures of South India known as the Dravidian languages. So there's a cultural difference, there's a genetic difference um, that you find, uh, the linguistic differences that you find both in Northern South India, West and East India. These are how you understand the major migrations. The migrations that happened after that is the Yavanas, that is the Greeks, Scythians, Shakas, Parthians, Pallavas, Kushans, who are Central Asians, and later the Turks, the Mongols, the Afghans who came into India, the Persians who came into India, they had the same genetic mix uh, as um, the Indo-Europeans, and therefore we don't find a genetic shift, but we do find a cultural shift happening. For example, uh, we know that when the 
Turks and the Afghans came to India. New language called the Persian language became the court language. When the Europeans came to India 500 years ago, English slowly became the court language or the official language of the country. So you see these things happening. Uh, you know that the vernacular or native languages of India emerged in a very big way a thousand years ago uh, when um, the Turks entered India and conquered Delhi. So after that period, you suddenly find languages like um, Kannada, Telugu, um, Malayalam rising in a very big way. They were there before, but it becomes a major language. So migration shifts culture. So I believe a very historical and chronological answer there. And that is why it's very relevant for the students of history also, uh, even if you are not preparing for civil services, but you're planning to. Uh, such kind of historical reference become very important in your body of the answer. But also, as uh, uh, Devdutt also mentioned briefly about the debate. Okay, so uh, whether it's a debate or you know the uh, the DNA evidence or talking about the rice technology, these are certain things which will make your answer rich and different, and you will definitely have an express edge in your preparation. Okay, so this uh, was the second question. Now moving on to the third important connected question. So Devdutt, uh, there were many who left India to settle and find their homes elsewhere in the world. Can we uh, talk about such emigrants? Yes, many people left India. Let's begin, you know, let's go backwards. Who were right now, there are many people who are giving up Indian citizenship and traveling to other countries and settling abroad. Um, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily for working. So, for example, some people go and come back. They are the non-resident Indians. But there are certain persons of Indian origin. That means they gave up their Indian passport and they have migrated forever. Maybe in Australia, maybe in uh, United Kingdoms, Europe, USA, wherever. These are the diaspora. So, this is the major migration that has happened in the 20th century. But in the 19th century, a migration took place. It's called the indentured labor. And the indentured labor uh, move happened because when slavery was abolished in Europe, they needed cheap labor in uh, places like the Caribbean islands. And um, they asked very poor people in India that, you know, we will pay for you to travel to a better land for a few years you will be given no salary maybe you'll work almost like slaves but you'll pay for all the you know the cost of taking you there and then you are free and then you can set up your own business there and find a better life in another land and so you have people from many parts of india especially from bihar um and uh, the, um, Andhra Pradesh traveling um, took the Caribbean islands, uh, what is called West Indies. We use the word West Indies today. West India is not a country. It's a set of islands in the Caribbean. And these are the places where you'll find um, many uh, uh, indentured laborers. So the di they have traveled there. So that's one another group. Who else has traveled out of India? We know that uh, people have traveled um, you know, the Romani people or the gypsies have Indian roots and they have traveled out of India, um, maybe 500, maybe a thousand years ago. They have a genetic link with India and therefore there is a um, movement out of India. So you do find these migrations out of India. People often ask people that why did Indians not migrate as um, one of the reasons is because you, you see India is a very rich fertile land with river valleys. Wherever there is river valley there are civilizations. Egypt has only one river, the river Nile. When you talk of China you talk of two major rivers, the Yellow River, the Hango River. Um, when you talk of India however you talk of the Indus, you talk of the Ganga, you talk of Mahanadi, you talk of Godavari, Krishna, Kaveri. So, so many rivers which sustained large populations, there was no real reason to migrate out of India. The Later, there were cultural reasons that if you migrate out of India, um, you know, uh, you know, so the, there was no real um, reason to migrate. People would leave, even the tra traders stopped leaving India because of cultural reasons. They were told that you will lose your caste if you travel out of India. Uh, it is only in the 20th century that uh, people started migrating out of India because these caste rules were abandoned and there were better economic opportunities seen abroad. So people migrate out of India mostly for economic reasons. Um, uh, uh, and that's the main reason. We, uh, is India a safe place? Increasingly, some people say that... Uh, um, People are migrating out of India for security reasons. They don't feel safe in India. And that's, of course, a controversial statement. But 
it could be asked in questions. So the, these are the reasons for emigrations. We have got the diasporic immigrations. You have the indentured labor immigration, emigration, emigration with the E. And then you have emigration of um, the Romani people who have traveled out of India. So these are the major migrations that you have. All right, then. So aspirants can probably list down all these reasons for emigration in Indian history. And just reminds me, if you can connect it to, you know, some latest news about uh, immigration happening in uh, recent times. So your history can be connected, your cultural history can be connected to the present times. And it makes more sense for a UPSC examination. You know, imagine you're, you're writing all those things in the conclusion of your answer. Well, now let's come to another question, which is very relevant, not only from the perspective of history and culture, but also society in general. But since I said in the beginning that everything is rooted in culture and history, and I'm talking about the term internal migration. So Devdat, I'm sure students want to know about internal migration from your perspective. So internal migration is an important concept that we often forget. Um, while we talk about India, you know, India is a very large country. There is the Himalayas in the north, there are Deccan uh, Plateau in the middle, there are the coastal regions. And we do know that by and large, people came into India, people didn't leave India, relatively speaking. Um, but within India, there has been a lot of migration. So internal migration is a conversation that we need to have. Uh, for example, uh, we know that the North-South migrations are indicated by stories like Agastya Muni, Rishi Agastya Muni traveling from North to India across the Vindhya Mountains, making the Vindhya Mountain bend. So all these mythological stories of how the Vindhya Mountain bowed to enable um, uh, you know, Agastya Muni to, to come from the North of India to the South of India. Uh, then we have stories of Parshuram migrating and establishing lands like the region of the Konkan coast, the Kerala coast. That's again indicative of a, some kind of a migration um, uh, from the north to the south. Then you have stories of Krishna migrating from Mathura to Dwaraka. Again, that is a migratory story. We have stories of the Jains migrating from the Magadan region to Shavan Benagola, which is in Karnataka. And then there are stories of Jains migrating to the Gujarat coast as traders during the Solanki dynasty in 10th century. So you have these migrations. So uh, why did they migrate to Karnataka? Because there was a famine in Magadha uh, around uh, 2,300 years ago. Why did they migrate out of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu? Because they were persecuted around 1,000 years ago by the newly rising Bhakti Hindu movements in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and they started migrating out. So you have these stories of the Jain migrations. Um, you, we know that um, uh, weaver communities in India were invited by kings to different lands. So there is a internal migration of weaver communities. Then we always hear stories of kings who would invite uh, Brahmins from Kashmir, from Kanyakbuja, from Kashi, KKK, Kashmir, Kanyakbuja, Kanyakbuja is Kanpur and um, Kashi to different lands. So you have these migration from these uh, places to Bengal, to Odisha, to Maharashtra, to Karnataka, to Kerala, to Andhra Pradesh, to Tamil Nadu. So these migrations are happening of internal migrations of Brahmin communities, internal migration of uh, weaver communities, uh, these must be kept in mind. Then in the uh, medieval times, uh, there was something known as uh, military service that was offered uh, by um, these uh, ascetic warrior monks who would be yogis, who would be fighting, but there were also these fighting mercenaries. You see, um, when the Muslims came to India, they brought with them um, both warriors and courtiers from Persia and Central Asia. But in 13th century, there was a Mongol uh, invasion of the Islamic world, after which migration from Persia to India became very difficult and local talent had to be sourced both for court work as well as for military services. And during this time, we find migration of many communities uh, to different parts of India, the warrior communities. So therefore, you'll find stories of Bengali kings who say they were Rajputs, Nepal kings who will say they were Rajputs. So the migration of soldiers to different parts of India, the Marathas who traveled to Karnataka. So soldiers traveled, merchants traveled, um, uh, 
merchants by merchants, I mean the weavers traveled, uh, Brahmins traveled, so a lot of internal migrations have taken place in our country. The Jains have traveled. Um, this is important to uh, understand in India. All right then. So uh, it seems like we've covered most of the static and dynamic part around this topic of migration and students would realize now that this topic is not just related to society or social issues, but it is rooted in culture and history and explained so well by Devdutt Patnayak. Uh, now let's move on to our next segment. That's a new segment that we are starting today where we are going to talk about a cultural term and we call it term in news. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, today's term is, well, it's Siddhis. And uh, I request Devdutt to explain what does this term mean? Um, you know, a question can be asked to people about uh, how did Africans come to India? It's very important when we talk of Europeans coming to India, while we talk of people from Northwest coming to India, the Turks, the Central Asians, even the um, Chinese coming from there. We hear of people coming from the eastern part of India. We often forget that many Africans came to India. Um, they were usually brought into India. Maybe they were traders, but many of them were slaves and they were brought, they were brought by Portuguese. So the Portuguese brought uh, African slaves and you know the uh, Muslim kings especially the Bahamani kingdom which controlled the Deccan had trade links and would get African slaves. Now there's a very big difference in which these people were treated by the Muslim communities and the Europeans or the Christians. The European Christians treated them like slaves like really oppressed them and you have stories of some of them being thrown into the sea to protect the sea from sinking during storms. You have stories of Portuguese people burying them with treasures in the hope that their ghost will protect the treasures till their descendants come. Um, so you have uh, temples in the east coast of India, sorry, the western coast of India in Karnataka and Kerala, temples related to um, Kapiri Devatas, which are considered to be the uh, spirits of African slaves who were buried alive to protect treasure. So you have these stories in the western coast of India in Karnataka and Kerala. But um, we also know that the African slaves who were taken by the Muslim communities of India rose in ranks as courtiers. Some of them were raised as uh, courtiers and aristocrats and were very well educated. The most famous famous man being Malik Ambar and um, uh, you know who lived in the Maratha kingdoms and was very respected by the people in the 17th century. Um, Jahangir wanted to defeat him in battle and could not do so. And there's a very famous picture of Jahangir painting that he wants to kill Malik Ambar but he can't and Malik Ambar played a very important role in um, Maratha Mughal politics at that time. So he was of African descent. So we sh there may be a question on Siddhis and Siddhis were were those who settled in India from Africa and right now they're found in parts of Karnataka, parts of Gujarat and they, um, they some of them practice Islam. Um, they are considered to be low castes. Um, uh, caste is always a controversial topic in India, but it's important to know a little bit about Siddhis. Uh, when you talk of IMA, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, the symbol uh, of um, it comes from a Siddhi mosques and the, the mosque that means was built by the Siddhi people. And it's important to remember the African roots of the Siddhi people. Uh, they were very famous for their music and African music, which comes in certain practices that they brought uh, uh, to India. Uh, so a few points on Siddhis is always important to have when you think about immigration in India. So this was the cultural term or the term of the week. From term, let's move to news. So there are certain important news items with respect to culture, history, tradition and art, which you should know for your examination point of view. One such news was around the dancing girl figurine, which was discovered in Mohanjodaro in 1926. Recently, it found itself into some kind of controversy. Keeping the controversy aside or the politics aside, let's understand from Devdutt something more relevant for your exam point of view around this topic of the dancing girl of Mohanjodaro. The dancing girl of the Indus Valley civilization has been coming in the news recently. Um, a giant image of hers has been recreated um, 
and uh, unfortunately she has been given clothes while the original image did not have clothes and it has been painted pink and she's been called a high priest of the temple these are all uh, imaginary ideas they have no basis in fact uh, what we know is that it's a tiny uh, uh, image of bronze uh, made um, you know uh, by the lost wax technique which is advanced technique it's only about 10 centimeters high it's a very small statue and uh, this was discovered in the 1926 by Ernest McKay um, and John Marshall the archaeologist at that time referred to it as the dancing girl based on how she was standing you now it's an image of a young girl um, she's not wearing clothes but she's wearing a lot of bangles there are cowrie shells around her neck but the way she stands shows a great confidence in her body and john marshall said that this confidence he saw in the devadasis of india and therefore he called it a dancing girl we really don't know whether she was a dancing girl and we are imposing certain ideas on that it's just an image of a young girl with one hand a kimbo on her side standing in a very confident stance with bangles in her hands um, and kauri shells around her neck and probably no clothes uh, maybe this image like many images in india today uh, were decorated in those days or maybe it was a toy but a bronze toy would be a slightly expensive one to have uh, but that's all we know about it we do know that it what does it tell us about um, harappan culture it shows us that perhaps women uh, had um, it was a culture where women were respected you know the the stance the confident stance of the woman tells us a lot they had technology the bronze technology the lost wax technology cowrie shells around the neck indicate it could be used as currency bangles are something very interesting archaeologists have found that indians uh, you know loved bangles while in the west you have armlets and bracelets you don't have bangles indian seems to be obsessed with bangles and these bangles were made using conch shells um, which are found in the gujarat uh, coast in the coastal part of uh, gujarat and they were exported from the indus valley civilization and even today chuda is worn using camel bones using conch shells across india bangles are a very important part of indian femininity and perhaps is linked to the indus valley civilization Thank you so much Devdutt for enlightening us with this information not only with respect to migration which was our central topic today but also terms and uh, this particular news item which you discussed with us ladies and gentlemen boys and girls all your aspirants this is a show which talks about art and culture and we have an expert with us that is Devdutt Patnaik Make the make the best use of this information, this analysis, these facts in your examination. That's all for today. We'll come back next week with next new fresh topic. Till then, goodbye and remember: think smart, work hard, conquer your goal. Invaders are of different types. There is the Raider like Mahmud of Ghazni, uh, who comes into India, takes away the wealth from the Somnath Temple. These raiders do not wish to control the political and economic systems of the land. Then there are colonizers, second type colonizers. Colonizers want to take over uh, the. economic and the political systems of the land they also settle in the land so the khiljis the lodis the moguls they settled in india they came from outside they settled in india and they took over the political and economic system so these are the colonizers and then there are the imperialists like the british they didn't want to settle in india they took the political system the economic system and they plundered the india's wealth and took it back to england there are certain things which have shaped the indian history to a large extent from ancient to modern times one such theme or topic is that of invasion and that is the theme of our discussion today with devdutt patnaik hello everyone i am manish shrivastav and i welcome you all to upsc essentials show art and culture with devdutt patnaik You all are aware about the format of the show. We take up a question by an aspirant, break up into smaller parts, and Devdutt answers all those parts in his lucid yet unique way of explaining students. Yes, this is a kind of a free class or lecture on art and culture, which is not only useful for your exams related to UPSC or any state civil services exam, but also to acquire that knowledge in general. So let us begin. with the question from the aspirant 
Here is the question. So Devdutt, as you see, this question is in general talking about invasion, but it's very important because it connects such an important part of Indian history, uh, which has such a long time span to something called culture. But I believe in order to begin with this topic, let us first ponder over a question and differentiate between migration and invasion. Uh, our viewers, our students and aspirants would know that our last episode uh, talked mostly about migration. They uh, explained all nitty gritties of migration. Now let's begin with this differentiation between differentiating between what is migration and what is invasion. Over to you, Dave. Hi. So last time we discussed about migrations, right? People have migrated into India from Africa, from Central Asia, from um, Southeast Asia. So migration is happening around the world and migration usually happens for uh, political reasons. They're trying to escape persecution or for economic reasons. You are coming towards a place where you can live a better life. There could be a reason, another reason for migration is adventure, but I mean, I, I don't think that's a major cause of migration. We usually migrate for economic benefits or to avoid political threats. But then the question comes is, how is an invasion different from a migration? So an invasion, the invader either comes, is it could, he could be a raider, he comes and takes your money away or takes your wealth away or takes human away as slaves. So that's a raid that I do. The other thing that an invader can do is he becomes your ruler. He takes over the political system. He takes over the economic systems and over time changes the culture of the land. That's an invasion. So I invade like a parasite. I come in and take over the political system, the economic systems and over time change the culture. A migration does not impact the political system, the economic system or the culture. Or if there is, the change is gradual over time. You participate in the culture. You participate uh, uh, in, you know, by bringing new ideas. And uh, over time, you do impact the political systems. You do impact the cultural systems. Uh, so migration is perhaps a slow transformation where you participate collaboratively while in an invasion your the key word is taking over the political system taking over the economic system which is what the europeans did in india which is what the turk and the central asian warlords who came into india 800 years ago they took over the administrative mechanism the political systems they took over the um, economic the you know the the collection of tolls the collection of taxes the collection of rent so the economic models were taken away um, you know they decided who would be king and who would how the administration would take place they took over the legal systems um, all that you know uh, is uh, the taking over what an invader will do that was a very lucid way of explaining the two terms and i'm sure students would now by now understand that uh, you know, your, your vocabulary is very important. You should know at least certain basic differences between these terms. And that is what our first question focused on. Now, let's move towards a little historical part. And let's go historically and talk about invasions and their effects. Now, let me just begin chronologically. Let's, let's talk about early India or which is popularly known as ancient India. And what are the major invasions and effects? If Devdutt, you can tell our students. So what were the ancient invasions into India? Uh, well, uh, we begin really when we talk about invasions, we talk with the Persians that, you know, we do know that the uh, certain parts of India were part of the Persian Empire. So that would have been the first invasion uh, after which we talk about the Scythians or the Shakas, uh, the Greeks, the Yavanas. Uh, the Parthians or the Pahalavas and the Kushans, all of which come from northwest part of the world. So Central Asia is where they come from. So when we are talking about the early invaders into India, we have the Persians and then the Alexanders. So you have the Yavanas, 
Then you have uh, after the Yavana Scythians and the Parthians, so Sakas and Pallavas. You have the Kushans who come from Central Asia. The Hunas during the Gupta period, they also come again from Central Asia. So these are the invaders to India. Now there's a controversial point because before that, a thousand years, maybe 1500 years before this uh, Greek, Scythian, Parthian, Han, Kushan invasion into India, um, uh, we do have the Aryan migration. Now, is that an invasion? Uh, you know, originally people thought it was an invasion and all that, but we now are fairly confident that it was a migration which happened over centuries. It did impact two things. The DNA changed, a new DNA entered the land, so there was marriage happening. So we do know that the, uh, the genetic structure changes, what is called the ancestral North Indian ge gene emerges with the step pastoral gene within it. So there is marriage happening and we know that the culture changed and you have the Vedic culture emerging as Aryan men married local women. But it doesn't seem to be an invasion. Scholars are fairly caught. There would have been a little violence here and there, but they didn't come as an invading force. Unlike the Greeks, the Yavanas, the Scythians, the Parthians, the Huns, the Kushans. Now, they are very significant. This ancient invasion, this period between 300 BCE and 300 CE, and most of it impacts North India, not South India. Mm -hmm. So, when we talk about the uh, Persians, we really talk about the Sindh region, the Gandhara region. These are parts which are now in Pakistan. Because of the Persian, what is the impact of this invasion? Uh, we have the new script, the Brahmi script emerging. The pillars that were used by the Mauryans seem to be under Persian influence. The pillars uh, topped with the images of elephants and bulls and wheels. Although the pillar themselves used an Indian technology, which is the polish and the single stones. So these are Indian technologies, but clearly inspired by Persian ideas. What happened with the, when you talk about the Yavanas or the Greeks, we know know that they uh, introduced us to the use of images. So the earliest Buddha images appear then. We see Buddha appearing like a Greek god. We have images of Hercules associated with Buddha. So this I idol image, image making comes with the Greeks. Scythians, um, also known as the Western Satra part, which is Rajasthan area, Raj, those regions, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Girnar, you have Rudra Daman, um, the Scythian, the Shaka king using uh, Sanskrit to uh, declare his prasasti, what is called his, his uh, legal declaration as a king for the first time. Sanskrit is being used uh, and it's done by a Scythian king. So that's an important point to remember. I think it's 100 AD. Um, you know that the Parthians, the Pahala, you know the word Pahalwan, which we use even today, comes from Pahalavi, which they are separate, not Pallavas. Pallavas are from Tamil Nadu. These are Pahalavas, or which is Parthians. And that's an important people to remember. I'll come back to it a little later. Uh, Huns are res responsible for the destruction of Buddhist monasteries in the uh, northwest part of India. So that's a very important thing. And they were probably sh following Shaivism. And Kushans are important because they create a vast empire network across the Hindu Kush, extending from Mathura. And we have the earliest images of Hindu gods uh, between the Indo-Greeks, the Greeks, the Yavanas, their coins have images of Krishna, the images of Balaram, the Heliodorus pillar, which talks about Garuda, which is again a Yavana uh, influence. Um, we know that the Kushan kings, Kanishka, uh, is, is interested in Buddhism, but there is also images of Durga coming from his time, Shiva coming from his time, the earliest images. So this is the impact of those invaders into India. All of them seem to be influenced by Buddhism a lot. Uh, you have uh, Milinda Panna uh, or Meanda uh, linked to uh, Buddhism. You have got Kanishka linked to Buddhism. Um, so these are the impact of these invasions in the ancient period. So when we talk about invasions, general perception in Indian minds or students' mind is about the medieval times so or the medieval period. Though we will we'll see and we have also seen in the previous question that invasion is just not limited to the medieval times. But having said that, uh, since we are going chronologically and historically, if, that, if you can throw some light, you know, on the medieval times and invasions, uh, 
say around 14th century and onwards what do you have to say about the major invasion in that time span of medieval history ancient period is um, slightly different from the medieval period now medieval period we have to be careful or in the old days medieval period meant when the islamic invasions begin or the central asian begins 800 years ago 1000 years ago uh, but really the medieval period begins with the end of the gupta period or around the gupta period so about 1500 years ago and that's the early medieval period and the late medieval period the early medieval period is when we're talking about chalukyas rashtrakutas pallavas cholas uh, and we are seeing indian economy becoming less mercantile and more agrarian and the rise of raja mandala states even uh, and that is the time when indians are trading a lot with southeast asia suvarna bhumi vietnam is using sanskrit uh, cambodia is using sanskrit there are hindu gods and hindu polities or systems of politics found in southeast asia um, so trade is happening but there's no invasion as such all the indian ideas are traveling outside india to southeast asia to cambodia to vietnam to thailand to indonesia so that's happening we know the chola kings are fighting for the sea rights with the sri vijaya kings of indonesia in 10th century but the invasion the main invasion that we talk about around the is the mahmud of ghazni coming in but he's a raider he comes and raids the somnath temple i think he comes by the bolan pass and he raids so he takes money away from india he doesn't rule the country by the mahmud but 200 years later um, the ghurids come in and the they come and they want to rule the land they settle in the land they stand, they take over the political system they take over the economic systems they break temples and build mosques they build the qutub minar is being built at that time they are establishing and these um, the qutub minar uh, um, and there is the uh, the minar of Ru of uh, jam which is in afghanistan so it's in the western you know this pillar what we call the qutub minar is one uh, of two pillars one pillar is found on the other side of the hindu kush uh, built by the ghurid brothers they were two brothers and one brother builds it in afghanistan and uh, on the western side on the eastern side and in near delhi or at delhi we have this pillar being built and it's the first time mosques are coming into india that happens 800 years ago in the 12th century um, uh, the ghurid kings are followed by the mamluks who are their slaves and they rise to Uh, power like Altamash, Aibak, Altamash, Balban, Razia Sultan. These are the stories. Then you have um, the Khiljis, the Lodi, uh, Tughlaqs, the Lodis. These are the early Delhi Sultans. They are all having roots in. They are Turks. They are Afghans. They are coming from Afghanistan. They are coming from Central Asia. They are coming into India. They are not very Persian, but they are introducing a new court culture, which is uh, the court language is changing. So the early medieval period, we found Sanskrit being used as the court language, uh, while and the system is called the Mandala state, where a king is powerful, and then there is Raja, there is Maharaja, the Raja, this kind of segmentary state. which is called our integrative state which is called but this is replaced by a new economic and political system the political system is uh, where the king is the leader and he's using the persian language in his court he's building mosques uh, and the economic system which is changing is that he introduces the ikta system the khiljis introduce the ikta system that is uh, villages and lands are given to warlords and they can take a part of the harvest in exchange they have to maintain horses and provide for the army of the sultan so you find this new system emerging whereby uh, what we now call landlordship so the, you know a, a village is the source of income in those days and uh, you have a warlord being given this village and he still you know take the part of the harvest and in exchange you have to give me soldiers and fight for me at time if you don't do that i will not give you the harvest so this system did not exist before in india previously in india the king would the rajmandala system which existed the king lived in the center 
and he would defeat another king and tell that other king you pay me tribute so he would not topple the king he would not put his own governor there he would just tell the king if you have to give me a tribute uh, so the king had uh, you know if you look at the rajamandala model uh, the, he didn't disturb the kingship of a local land but the new persian model which comes in the 12th century in india disrupts the system and creates these tributary states Uh, system and ikta comes into it so that is the that is the change that happens in the medieval period uh, you have the a new world order emerging religion is changing politics is changing economics is changing and that's why it's called an invasion we should also talk about the moguls at this time so the moguls were the last the big ones to come from persia and via uzbekistan and they defeated the lodi kings and this is all happening in north india they of course going right up the south also some of them are invading right up to the south now remember when these people came into the country the uh, turkish warlords they brought paper with them kagaz kalam they brought new ideas with them uh, but the moguls did something different what the moguls did is unlike the previous sultans who kept an arms length with the local native population the moguls actively married women from the rajput clans and therefore created a collaborative ecosystem which gave them a huge political lever that enabled them to control much of north india uh during aurangzeb's time of course they start controlling even south india and therefore th- there's a major cultural change happening and this is when what is called the indo islamic uh, world emerges and it's really enabled through marriage rajput women marrying into mughal households which akbar initiates and that's where the major shift happens um Akbar's grandfather Babur who is the first one to come to India uh, introduces new gardens what's called the char bag gardens so this char bag gardens with fountains is something which starts getting introduced um you have persian architecture coming into india the use of marble on red stone starts to appear so you have these new systems of architecture changing because of this invasion the moguls bring a new way of thinking to india All right then. So we have covered ancient part and we have covered the medieval part. Now coming to the most contemporary, or if I say the nearer past, and we're talking about the European coming of Europeans, and you know the, that time period of what we are uh, call in history as modern Indian times. So what about the invasions, uh, and how do we study invasion during the times of modern indian history or coming of europeans uh, say from the time period of 16th century and uh, beyond so in the 15th century europeans found a way to reach india by sea now that's the final invasion that took place it is we can call it the modern period but really is the european period is because in the 15th century when vasco da gama comes uh, to kerala uh, and establishes a sea route now that's very important when you understanding this period you must understand this great war that was happening between europe and the middle east middle east was uh, governed by islamic ideas the arabs the persians and islam and europe was christian now this you need to understand a little bit of history about europe before it was europe it was called the mediterranean region the mediterranean region was controlled by romans and the romans were pagans and polytheists they didn't have a religion as such but in 300 ad the roman emperor who faced a lot of internal and external threats converted to christianity and for the first time religion becomes a political lever 300 ad is when constantine becomes a christian and he declared that everybody in my country should become christian this is the first time this happens before that nobody bothered with religion so much and that is when the roman empire starts to collapse now we should remember this why is it important because remember rome was an important trading partner with india in the, all luxury goods would go from india to rome via ships via middle east and in exchange we would get gold that is why india was called soni ki chidiya because the roman complained that india was draining their gold the bullion was going out of the roman empire this is an important point to remember because when the roman empire becomes christian and the roman empire starts to go down this trade collapses and around 300 ad you find that 
this something changes in India. The Gupta Empire is rising and the mercantile empire, the mercantile economy is changing into an agricultural economy and our in Indian trade is no longer international after this period. It becomes internal. There is more internal trade happening. Lots of internal trade. We see a drop in the nature of currencies, the gold coins, the kind of currencies are shifting. There's a little shift happening. This is happening in the third century. The seventh century, Islam rises in the Middle East and Islam takes over the southern part of the Mediterranean and the northern part of the Mediterranean remains Christian. And that's how Europe is born. This happens around the seventh, eighth century. Then the European Christians fight the Middle Eastern Muslims and that's the crusade, tenth century. The Muslim world, the caliphate, which is called, becomes a very powerful force connecting going all the way to China and India on one side and Europe on the other and all the trade routes come under the caliphate which is located in Baghdad which is modern Iraq then in the 13th century when the Khiljis are ruling India the Mongol empire rises the Mongols destroy the caliphate and a new and Islam goes through a dramatic change because eventually the Mongols also become Muslims in the Middle Eastern region the Mongols become Buddhist in the Chinese region now why should you remember this because remember India doesn't exist in isolation internationally things are happening and when you're understanding invasion of India you should understand what's going around the world the rise of Christianity Christianity in Roman Empire, the rise of Islam, Crusades, after which comes the Caliphate, the Caliphate, the rise of the Caliphate, the Caliphate controlling all the trade routes, which means Europe is now completely blocked away from the wealth of India and China. That's when the Marco Polo story happens because everybody wants to go to China. Uh, only the Italians are able to connect via the Islamic world. They are going towards China and India. And the Europeans are getting very, very angry. And after the Crusades, that is when the Renaissance and the Reformation takes place. Scientific discovery takes place from China. And through these trade routes, they get the magnetic compass. They learn about printing press and they discover sea routes. That's how the sea routes are discovered by Portugal and Spain. And then they find their way. Portuguese people find their way to India. Now, why did the Spanish people not come to India and only the Portuguese came? Because of of the Pope. The Pope, the Spanish and the Portuguese people were fighting and they go to the Pope and they said, please, the world, we have discovered a new place called America, a new continent, and we want to divide the spoils. And the Pope takes a line and draws a straight line and says, whoever is on the west side belongs to Spain and the east side belongs to the Portuguese. And therefore, the Portuguese traveled east and came to India and eventually took over the spice route. They defeated all the Arabs who were, until then the Arabs controlled the trade route from Middle East to India to Indonesia. That was the Arab sea routes. These routes were taken over by the Portuguese. Portuguese established themselves in Goa and in certain parts, in, they have certain colonies, in, for example, in Pondicherry on the uh, eastern coast. So you have these Portuguese colonies in uh, Goa, Daman, Diu, Karaikal. So there are these places where Portuguese come, but then the British come in the 16th century. And why is the British coming? The British is coming. They have Thomas Rowe comes and we know there are images of Thomas Rowe um, in the court of Jahangir and he starts trading with India. They come as traders into India. They're not coming to invade. They're coming to trade. But remember how they're taking over the sea trade from the Arabs and the Europeans, the Portuguese, the English, they do not like the Muslim rulers of the land. They call them Moors. And they say, we don't like the Moors. And this is a very important point to remember. Um, they did not like the Muslim rule. And India was being ruled by Muslims at this time, 16th century, 17th century. And over time, very cleverly, the British take over the administrative, the political machinery of India. That's what they do. They start as trading. And then they say, like consultants today, they say, hey, we'll take over your administrative services. We'll take over your defense services. You can just pay us money and you don't have to take care of all this. We will take care of your army. We will take care of your collection of taxes. We'll take care of administration. We'll take care of law and admin, law and order. And before the king knows it, the king has no power. And then that's how the East India Company took over. By 1757, they were so powerful. 
we know that the english and the french fought in india to control india they had fought in america also in america the british won but then eventually the british were kicked out by the local american republic and that is happening also remember the american revolution happens in the 18th century that's exactly when the british east india company is conquering and taking over the administration of india and effectively becoming the de facto rulers of india in then the 19th century the mutiny takes place and the government of england that is the british raj starts so it's not a private company anymore east india company is a private company and these are they they come into india now let me show you how this invasion changes india completely the east india company did not have any capital they didn't have any cash and the queen of england said i don't have any money to give you you make your own cash so they said how do we make generate wealth and they realized that the best way to make wealth is to sell drugs so they started uh, telling indians to manufacture opium in the 18th and 19th century and this opium would be sold in china in exchange for silver and that's how the east india company became cash rich they would force indians to grow opium and this opium would be sold in china that destroyed the chinese civilization even today the chinese talk about 100 years of humiliation they said we were humiliated by the europeans who sold opium to our people and destroyed our culture the silver came to india now indian farmers were growing opium a cash crop which means they were not growing rice and wheat and millets and bajra and jawar which they needed to eat this led to droughts that led to man made famines and people died in india lots of problems happened and india's economy started to collapse and then later the industrial revolution took place in england raw material from india so india which was a manufacturing hub became a supplier of raw materials which means the economic system also changed so the political system was taken over by the europeans specifically the british then the economic systems were taken over and that's why it's called an invasion that's how you define an invasion i hope that makes sense devda thank you for that chronological uh, you know development of understanding about invasions and i'm going to be 100% sure that students are going to benefit from it because you have not only focused on invasions uh, in time but also talking about its significance but you know a curious manas in me and i'm sure a lot of aspirants will be very curious we come across these terms when we talk about invasions like raiders colonizers imperialists we know these terms but it's difficult sometimes to differentiate between these terms so i'm i'm not sure if i'm right here to place this question but uh, if you may throw some light on uh, these uh, different kinds of invasions invaders are of different types there is the raider like mahmud of ghazni uh, who comes into india takes away the wealth from the somnath temple or there is nadir shah who takes kohinoor away from delhi in the 18th century attacks delhi raids delhi takes away its wealth to persia or ahmed shah abdali the afghan who enters india and plunders the north indian he these kings do not these raiders do not wish to control the political and economic systems of the land then there are colonizers second type colonizers colonizers want to take over uh, the economic and the political systems of the land they also settle in the land so the khiljis the lodis the moguls they settled in india they came from outside they settled in india and they took over the political and economic system so these are the colonizers and then there are the imperialists like the british they didn't want to settle in india they took over the political uh, they took the political system the economic system and they plundered the india's wealth and took it back to england so the mothership remained england that's an imperial power so three types of invaders all right then so this was about invasion and i think they've got touched on all the important aspects about uh, this particular topic and as i say that you know gagar me sagar bharna and that is what devdat does through you know his expertise and uh, the way he explains and it's very useful you know when you listen to some information some analysis some explanation it helps to retain in your mind for a longer time and that reminds me that now we have to move to another segment and that segment is known as culture in news so here is something what we are going to discuss with devdat something which was relevant in news from the culture point of view
So here is something which was in news, is in news and will remain in news for a longer time. So an investigation by the Indian Express and in association with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and Finance Uncovered has found uh, that the catalogue of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York includes at least 77 items linked to Subhash Kapoor, who is serving a 10-year jail term in Tamil Nadu for smuggling antiquities. So, dear aspirants, let's pause for a while and talk about it. Let's see what Devdutt has to tell things related to this particular, you know, antiquities, the laws and the smuggling. So, um, it's, uh, you know, the raiders come to India and take things away, right? So, recently the news, there's been this talk about the Prime Minister going to America and getting stolen goods back from America, from the Met Museum, lots of stolen objects. So, People steal things from the country and now that's become a major, that could be an important uh, question that is raised in the UPSC exams because, um, you know, uh, if you go to the museum in London, for example, you will find artifacts from ancient Egypt, from Iraq, Iran, India. And the question is, why are they there in England? And they were obviously plundered by the colonizers and taken away and people wanted back. Uh, then there are the smuggling trade because, you know, when an archaeological site is dug up, you find these fabulous things emerging from archaeological sites, bronze images, stone images, jewelry, and they are stolen in the black, sold in the black market for lots of money, sometimes even sold to museums and people are now asking them back to the country. So countries like Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, even India is asking for those collections to be brought back. We know that um, smugglers have taken a lot of India's wealth. I mean, the, the Kohinoor diamond really is from India and was, went via Afghanistan, via the Sikh Empire, eventually lands up in the crown of the Queen of England. So should it, does it belong to her or should it be brought back to India? Is a question to be asked. Now it's time for Devdutt's point to ponder. Point to ponders are becoming very famous. They're becoming very popular because they are not only helping us to link this episode with the next episode, but also, uh, you know, giving kind of a thought provoking ideas to students on what lines they should think upon when they are talking about art and culture. So here is Devdutt's point to ponder. So I want to leave you with a point to ponder. Can you understand India's culture without understanding its tribes? Remember, the tribal communities make up about 10 to 15 percent of India's population. So can you consider Indian culture without tribes? And what is their contribution? Think about it. So that's all for today. First of all, let me thank Devdutt Patnayak for doing this for us, for our aspirants, uh, giving them a different perspective, a very important perspective related to art and culture, which is not only related to art and culture, but also history. You may utilize these information, you know, these examples, these analysis in your essay writing and also have that extra express edge in your interviews too. Next time we are going to come up with another episode. Dave Dutt's Point to Ponder has given you a hint. Also, you can interact with me on live shows in the YouTube channel of the Indian Express under UPSC Essentials. I'm sure you must have uh, gone through one of it. You will have it more in the future. Send your questions at manas.shivastav at indianexpress.com or join our Telegram channel of the Indian Express UPSC Hub and get connected there. Do not miss to make the best use of our UPSC key, UPSC Essentials and UPSC Quizzes. Till then, before saying goodbye, as I say always, think smart, work hard, conquer your goal. Bye-bye. Many tribal communities have um, different forms of marriage. Um, uh, there are tribes in Odisha where the older woman marries younger men so that when she grows old, he takes care of her. Now, these are uh, 
uh, you know the family structures are very different uh, they may not understand what democracy voting rights private property and that brings them into conflict with political issues in one of our episodes devdat patnayak mentioned that you cannot understand culture without understanding its people and therefore we are here to discuss one group of people which have been asked many times in exams in one form or the other i'm talking about tribes hello everyone i am manas shrivastav and you are watching upsc essentials of the indian express we are back with our show art and culture with devdat patnayak so dear aspirants you know that the structure or the pattern of the show is that we take up a question by our one of the aspirants on that particular topic we break up into parts and devdat in his unique way in a in a you know student friendly way tries to explain every part to reach to the depth of the particular topic and issue in the process we cover various dimensions this particular uh, you know the session by devdat patnayak is not only useful in art and culture but you know you can make the best use of it when you're writing an essay or answering any mains related uh, questions on that particular topic so it can be a question on society where that particular theme can be very valid so before going ahead let's take up this question by our aspirant on our today's subject of tribes thank you for that question so devdat as you just saw that the question which the aspirant is asking is in line with what upsc asks some general questions in their mains examination so the question which is talking about the uh, about tribes representing the living tradition or the living culture living cultural tradition in india is a very valid question but the very first question if we do the break up should be understanding that what do we mean by tribes and how are tribes culturally and historically significant hum tribe ko kaise explain karenge so tribes are generally people who are closely related to each other they live in the same geographical area they get their economic sustenance from the land they live in uh um, they usually have poor technology that means they may be hunter gatherers uh, or hunter foragers uh, living in the forest they do not practice agriculture or uh, not much of sophisticated animal herding or some mining activities so the technology is relatively primitive uh, they are related to each other they have the common language common culture simple form of political systems um that's how you describe a tribe they are a compilation of bands who are unrelated to each other and clans who are related to each other the band small groups of people who are unrelated to, to each other clans slightly larger groups related to each other tribes a collection of bands and clans all of whom have similar economic patterns similar political structures connected to each other by a common language a common culture common rituals common beliefs common practices and generally low in technology uh, so they do hunter gathering work foraging work uh, and may not have sophisticated agriculture and mining technologies so why are tribes considered historically significant remember the earliest migration on Uh, into india happened about 50000 years ago and some of these communities um this is where all the tribes of india really come from afterwards many of them intermingled with later migrants who came say 10000 years ago 5000 years ago but the original substratum of india is tribal therefore the use in hindi ki wo um adivasi hain those who live um uh, from the primal adi means primal um some people use the word vanavasi saying that they are forest dwellers and they are not necessarily the original inhabitants but that's a political argument but we know that 
the earliest migrants and the language that they follow, some of the languages are very, very old. Uh, there has also been migration from the eastern side, a reverse migration. Those who went out of Africa via the eastern part came back from the eastern part. They are known as the Austroasiaticus people, languages like the Munda and in many parts of central India. In fact, now there are some cave paintings which show animals such as platypus, which is found in Southeast Asia in India. So these paintings have come. Obviously, people who migrated all the way till Australia came back somewhere around 10,000 years ago as per latest research, which means tribal communities have very ancient memories. Uh, when you study their stories, you know that they are people who have migrated a long time ago and they have sort of frozen in time because uh, they have not adapted to the newer technologies and the newer cultures which came later. That's why they're historical because, I mean, it's a choice, right? People want to live aligned with nature. They do not want the newer technologies. We should not use words like they are progressed or not progressed, developed, undeveloped. These are, I think, political words. We use them in government. But I think communities of people have a right to live the way they want to live. People live in forests. They want to live with the technologies. They are more aligned with nature. They are not polluting the ecosystem. Um, but modern life demands that they sort of adapt to modern life and which, depending on who is arguing, is good as well as bad. First of all, thank you, Devdutt, for, you know, hinting us to that debate or to that issue of looking everything from the lens of modernity. And probably students too should take a cue from this that sometimes in exams, the examiner want to, you know, quiz you on these particular issues, your view, your comments, uh, or the analysis part of it. So uh, from this, let's move on to the second question, which is more related to factual part, where, uh, you know, a student would like to know that what are some of the, uh, you know, uh, prominent tribes and their special features or special characteristics if we go geographically, uh, which you think students should know. I know it's not a very easy task to list down each and every tribe in this vast subcontinent, but um, I'm sure you can give them a clue that, you know, how they should go about it or how they should, you know, uh, develop a practice to learn about tribes and maybe which are some of the prominent tribes in our country, which they should remember. So which are the some of the prominent tribes um, and the special features geographically that everybody should know? Now, this is a tricky question. There are over 700 tribes in India distributed across all states. The oldest, uh, you know, from a genetic point of view, the oldest tribes are in the Andaman Islands, uh, the Jabua tribals. Uh, but um, there are many other uh, tribes across India. It's very difficult to remember all of them. I remember them from a geographical point of view. So I say North India, South India, East India, West India, and Central India. And that's an easy way. So Western India, Maharashtra, Gujarat side, you'll have the Varli paintings, Varli, Bheel, Dang. Um, when you go towards Central India, you get the Santhals of Bastar. So Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, these are the areas where you have the Santhals, the Gonds. Uh, if you go towards South, you have the Chenchus, the Tor Odas. If you go towards northeast, you have a mongoloid uh, uh, communities and Austroasiatic communities, and therefore you have the uh, Khasi, the Garo, the Kuki. Uh, the, remember, the word Naga is not actually a tribe name; it's an exonym. People who traded with the tribes in northeastern India called them Nagas, which mean people with either long years or they had holes in their ears or um, so that's the really the Noka word. So Naga is a word which is an exonym, which outsiders gave uh, Naga people, just as India was called Hind by Arabic people and eventually we became Hindustan. Same way, outsiders called the tribal people of Northeast India Naga and then the word Naga land emerged. So one has to be careful with the understanding of Naga word. Uh, so you find these different tribes across India spread geographically. That's the way I would remember it. Um, you could decide three, maybe five names. I don't think they'll ask you to list right now because there's a lot of conflict happening in the Manipur region. Perhaps questions on Northeast India tribal communities may be asked. I think that is a very relevant point which you mentioned that students should be aware of Northeast India because uh, it's so much in news and any and every aspect should be covered and especially when it comes to tribe and culture. So uh, students should make that note 
it can be asked in prelims it can be asked in mains cultural aspect or social aspect coming to the social aspect the question 3 uh, is more relevant to you know the social issues but you cannot you know separate the cultural issues from social issues in some uh, topics and students should know that so if if you may throw some light on the challenges which these tribes or the tribal culture face in our country what are these challenges so what are some of the challenges which tribal cultures face in our country now when you how do you answer this question i don't want to give you an answer which you can just write it down on a piece of paper think of a construct and i always follow the construct of lakshmi durga saraswati lakshmi is about resources and economics durga is about um power politics and saraswati is about uh, philosophy and culture and um, education and knowledge and so that's if you remember it this way you ask yourself what is the challenge they face economically so one of the challenges a tribal community faces economically is they depend on um, forest land and uh, these are reserved forests so that brings them into conflict with people who want to exploit the forests right they want to cut down the trees they want to cut take away the animals and so that puts them they are pushed deeper and deeper into the forests and that creates issues for them because they don't have enough land for them remember one of the features of tribal communities is that there is no private property there is communal property they they share the forest together they share resources together and therefore if you reduce that um, forest cover then obviously they suffer economically they don't have enough food they don't have enough nutrition which causes diseases malnourishment um, infant mortality rate rises maternal mortality rates rises so that's an economic thing from a political point of view um, they follow traditions and practices um which belong to their communities so they in this many tribal communities have um different forms of marriage um uh, there are tribes in odisha where the older woman marries younger men so that when she grows old he takes care of her now these are uh, uh, you know the family structures are very different uh, they may not understand what democracy voting rights private property and that brings them into conflict with political issues people want to control them control their resources enslave them and therefore um that creates a challenge and this is another kind of challenge the political challenges then comes the um philosophical challenges the world view of the tribal people is different it's connected to the land it's connected to their gods do we want them to change their religion their culture their language they are uh, sent to schools where they are taught uh, national languages and international languages hindi and um, english but are they taught their culture their songs their language um and this is this third conflict the saraswati conflict that they face so if you understand tribal communities from an economic point of view political point of view and from a philosophical point of view i think we will be able to answer this question better that's how you i would uh, answer the question systematically in these three groups and you will get uh, you will find your answers um, you know how our tribal characteristics one of the conflicts i mean the big conflicts is we use the words like uh, marxist naxalites uh, you know these are very very contentious issues but basically people who want to live their life their economic way their political systems is being challenged by a larger nation state which comes with national laws state laws regional laws tax rules um, which don't make sense to these communities and we are talking about a large number of people almost 10% of indian's population 700 dip- different communities across the states of india so they're not like one group they're different groups spread across and uh, we must understand they do face a lot of challenge in our country you know the best part i like about uh, the whole explanation is not just the content but also how you are telling students that how they can prepare a topic you know this this everything under the sun in upsc so it's difficult to talk about each and every remember each and every uh, topic and aspect but when you give us such, such constructs you know such like lakshmi durga saraswati and so on uh, it helps the students to uh, remember things and more importantly retain and reproduce in the examination so these are certain things which students you know can apply in their uh, preparation and uh, make their preparation more interesting okay and uh, this common question that art and culture is a dry subject you can do away with this notion if you do it in a more interesting manner and that is that is the thing you know which you should take from devdutt's lecture not just the content but also the way he is telling things can be something which will 
give you a lot of help in your examination now let's move to the next question where uh, let's come to the more uh, governance and policy part because as i said that you cannot separate one topic uh, and uh, from the you know other category you have to understand it from the social point you have to understand it from the governance and policy form point so let us ask this question that you know what has india indian government what has indian government done to protect uh, the tribal culture in if we say post independent india the most important thing that the indian government has done has created this concept of scheduled tribes so they are listed in the constitution and deserve special protection there's a recognition of a uh, tribal community that their culture is very different from mainstream societies it is regional it is based on the local geography um, as i said they have their own culture they may not align with modern mainstream technological economic and political practices um, they do not have concepts like private property and they would have common property they have their own gods their own religions and that requires affirmative action in the part of the state to protect them so i think the great thing we have done the bashed listing them and acknowledging their existence um, of course uh, they need uh, support so some uh, providing them education facilities health facilities and enabling them to protect their cultures by providing economic opportunities without destroying their lifestyle is has will always be a challenge uh, a child who comes to a government school learns english hindi and is part of the mainstream goes back to the village and his friends who or her friends who do not go to the school live the local lifestyle this will create a fragmentation of the tribal society uh, and these are challenges that the government does face um um so the they are as citizens of india they are entitled to a vote they are entitled they have a voice um there is a ministry designed that are for their upliftment how much of it is implemented is of course a question that we have to see state governments also have uh, departments which work with tribal welfare so all these are the initiatives of the state to uplift them but we have to ask the question what is upliftment development progress as i said these are contentious issues and can always be argued positively and negatively do we want to mainstream them will that destroy their culture and take tribal communities to museums or should they be kept frozen in time reserved not part of the modern ecosystem that's another argument um and these form great essays which i'm sure you'll write in your exams so you see when you are doing a topic you are not just covering it from the perspective of art and culture a wholesome preparation is when when you are able to connect the dots you are able to talk about that particular topic in terms of society in terms of governance and policy so we are trying to take our videos or the lectures which devdat patnaik is giving or the topics which he is discussing to that level where you can cover various aspects of a topic uh, and that is something the that, that is a useful preparation so we've covered you know the cultural aspect we've covered the social aspect we've covered the governance and policy aspect now let's move on to uh, some segment which uh, we talk about a lot in our shows now uh, the first segment which we're going to talk about is the term of the week now the term of the week or the term which devdat is going to take up today is related to what we are studying and we are talking about pvtgs so devdat what is or who are pvtgs so one of the terms that we need to remember is pvtg particularly vulnerable tribal groups there there are about 700 tribal groups in india and about 10% of them uh, face a um, they particularly vulnerable what does it mean it means these are homogenous